Hi, I am Kalpana Singhal and I am delighted to welcome all of you back to the day 2 of the CXO Global Security Summit and Awards 2022. Global Security Summit, as you all know, is one of India's largest exclusive conferences and platforms dedicated to security excellence among the global community of Chief Information Security Officers and Security and Risk Leaders. Yesterday was phenomenal in terms of the number of people who logged on live to the conference. We had over 2000 Chief Information Security Officers and Security Leaders as attendees. To state further, Day 1 was memorable in terms of power packed sessions with insightful keynote addresses, thought provoking panel discussions and interesting fireside chats. Interestingly, we have woven the overall conversation of the Global Security Summit 2022 around the theme of security resilience with innovation which coincides with the current security focus of the enterprises. How we differentiate is we bring together the foremost industry experts and security leaders from across the industry to share insights and real life examples on building security resilience and a culture of innovation as a line between physical and digital business flowers. In fact, day two is going to be even more, more exciting with thought provoking sessions on topics like balancing finance and security priorities, the disruptive deep tech to protect from advanced cyber threats, and vision for security and risk management 2022, to name a few. As the cybercrime world is likely to touch $10 trillion by 2025, which is almost tenth of the global GDP, the agenda for Global Security Summit is designed to ensure that enterprises are prepared to meet the security challenges. Do watch out the agenda for today and not to forget, in the evening we will continue to recognize excellence in the security communities through the prestigious Global Cyber Security Leadership Awards. The objective of the recognition is to acknowledge the innovative spirit of the C-suite decision makers. So we hope you continue to keep pushing the bar year on year and we continue to deliver a superlative glitch free event for you. So once again, have a great day of valuable takeaways and interactions with security experts and thought leaders. Thank you. I'm Dr. Rizwan Khan, and today we are going to talk about the finance and the security spending. Uh, professionally, I have been working with organizations around the globe, uh, most notably in uh, Vietnam, Thailand, US, and Pakistan. Uh, Currently, one of my role is CFO and CIO of a manufacturing company. There, I am dealing with uh, the finance and the security of IT infrastructure. Generally, it is considered that uh, the spending on security is useless in terms of uh, there is no tangible benefits. However, this notion needs to be corrected in a way that when finance people, they need to look into the security spending in three different perspective, if you like. Um, one is the data itself, that how we are going to secure the data of the organization that we have there, for example, costing, for example, uh, inventory, etc. The other aspect is from the data privacy point of view. Um, in any organization, there are some private information that are available. And if you are operating in European region or some other jurisdictions, where the data privacy laws are in, uh, enacted, there it, they, there's a big issue. Uh, for example, in Vietnam last year, the data privacy law has been drafted and it is being implemented slowly. Uh, there you need, we need to be very careful how we are going to secure the data. Uh, for example, GDPR in Europe, there we need to uh, make the perimeter for the data to ensure that the data is not going outside of the uh, European Union. Uh, so that is from the data privacy perspective. Most uh, important aspect of the uh, security spending is to avoid and cripple uh, when these attacks 2021 and 2022, we see that there is a growing trend. There is roughly about 72% increase in the security events where the firms and the companies that are not ready to uh, protect their data from the attacks 
they were attacked and those are from the utility sectors from manufacturing companies and most notably from the healthcare sector healthcare sector contains the sensitive data of the patients and other people and that will cause a lot of issues when it comes to the security breaches now <clears throat> the security breaches come in different forms and different shapes and with the advent of uh, cryptocurrency it becomes practically impossible to track the criminals and to find out that what they are doing and where they are hiding so from finance point of view we need to look into the uh, security spending more as more as a preventive measure to ensure that we prevent any security breach to occur there are certain measures that one can take for example saas based uh, security <clears throat> that is software as a service based security uh, for example integrated platforms for example redundancy etc ransomware perhaps is the most dangerous among all the attacks uh, that basically cause the data useless the computer systems are crippled and in some cases the data has been leaked to the dark web uh, for if the uh, ransom is not being paid there have been incidents where the firms are not ready and part of the reason is that both finance and it departments they do not understand the value of prevention everybody is relying on if it did not happen to us it will not happen to us but as the murphy law goes if something can goes wrong it will and hence the same issue with the security so we need to ensure that <clears throat> the security is of paramount and the security starts from the top three lines of defense is as every, all of us know about that uh, is there but the first thing that is most important is that the top management is aware of the significance and the importance of the security number 1 number 2 uh, the managers they know they are being trained properly and uh, they can uh, respond when the any security incident happen and the third and the most important one perhaps is that the people who are working on the data on the system they must be aware of the security issues they must be trained properly and they know whom to contact when any incident happen a lot of in these incidents happen because the worker the users do not know what to do when any security incident happens and this causes a lot of issues in terms of alleviation of the incident in terms of remediation and in terms of taking the system online again if you look into this generally the rule is that within 10 minutes you should be able to respond to that but there is a statistic that shows that it takes generally 66 days to remediate the security breach the most significant data breach perhaps or security breach perhaps is the example of deloitte where it happened somewhere back in october and till march they did not find out that there has been a security breach this is a classic example where the giant companies consulting companies they are into that area they think that they are well secured but somehow they did not detect that one so prevention is one thing the security spending should be in such a way that it will also help you to detect the security breaches and the last but not the least that that needs to be corrected in a timely manner so all these aspects if you look into the security uh, spending we see that it is not only important to find out that we uh, are working on that security spending in a right manner but also we should be able to uh, justify that spending in terms of roi the biggest challenge perhaps is that how do we justify the roi on security spending and that we could do it by looking into the importance and the significance of the data there are organizations who provide the insurance based on the estimate of the data value one may have so we may argue that the spending that we have on security will be justified by the value of the data that we may lose or that may may be jeopardized so this is a little bit brief about the security spending from the viewpoint of the finance uh, uh, perspective thank you very much for listening to me hello all My name is Eris Kaplan and I would like to say a few words about cybersecurity threats and various other problems that we are facing in the cybersecurity world. First allow me to introduce myself. My name is Eris Kaplan. 
I'm the CTO of a company called Cyber 2.0. I am also an official representative of the European Committee from the Israel Boards of course, Miro Boards of course, that write the ESA rules regarding cyber regulation around the world. And I've been doing uh, cyber support and acting as an instructor for CISO for many, many years now. Uh, I want to bring to your attention what I think and probably you think as well, is the main problem regarding cybersecurity and why the attacker always winning. The problem is as follow. We are at war. Everyone try to attack everything. There are criminal-based organizations, there are small hackers, there are company-based organizations, and there are hackers supported by countries, which are the most problematic one. There is a silent war going behind the scene, And the main issue is as follow. The attacker are always one step ahead. We know how to defend. We know how to detect anomalies. We know how to detect behavioral analysis. We have all the tools. We have encryptions. We have everything that we can conceive. And we are always doing better and try to defend better. We are using tactics that developed by uh, Mother Nature for billions of years. We can defend. We are doing a good job. But the attackers have the same abilities. They know what we protect against. And they are always one step ahead. If I can defend against a specific attack, they will devise a new attack. Then I will devise a way to defend against this type of attack. And it's a vicious circle of responses from the defender and, by, and bypassing and evading from the defender side. That is why every time you can hear about a new type of attack, something else that has managed to pass the firewall blockade, the antivirus blockade, and the EDR blockade. They are all working in the same constant methodology, trying to identify attack before they happen, trying to use anomaly, behavior, neural networks, everything that we can think of, but the attacker are there as well. They come from the industry. They are backup. by research and funds from countries and organization. And they are not, as what they always was, someone small in the basement. They are backed up money. They're doing an excellent job. And they managed to penetrate and bypass every defense that we put against them. If we truly want to defend against the new type of threats they are presenting, if we truly want to be able to defend every time that a new threat, a new vulnerability, or a new type of attack arrives, We need to completely and drastically change the way that we are thinking. We think straight. We think nature. We use antivirus. We use everything that we know, but it's not enough. It will never be enough. The only way that for us, the defenders, to protect against some threat is to do something so radically different, so outside the box, that the attacker will be mind blown, that they will have to go circle around it and there will be no way for them to mitigate it. A completely new way to defend against cyber threat. An example for such a way can be chaos mathematics. Let's take our body for example. Our body works in a very specific way. There are defenders, there are attackers, the white cells, the red blood cells, There are antibodies and they are learning how the, anti the viruses and the various bacteria that work. And they are always trying to block them and stop them, but the virus mutate and change. And so does the body accumulate it, but we are always getting sick because the body cannot respond fast enough. If you put, for example, chaos mathematic on uh, the communication between the cells inside the bodies, And if you use mathematic in order to communicate it, the only thing that will happen then that the, the first bacteria or virus will be able to infect the first cell only from the billions of cells inside our body. And then they will be blocked with their, no other cell will be able to communicate them. It will be blocked. It is a common fact. Everyone knows that it, there is no way to mitigate, to stop the first attack on the first computer. But if we will be able to relinquish that, to be aware that that is happening, and from that point forward to create an unpassable barrier to the disrupt communication that allows the computer to communicate in a way that so far has been not thought of, that the attacker will not be able to bypass using moving target defense, 
new ways to mitigate zero trust without interfering with the user's interface or programs, ways that the attacker will not be able to bypass because the mathematics is unbreachable because it is unsolvable. Chaos mathematics and various other tools allow us to do such things. If we can take the chaos and put it into communication, if we can control what inside this communication barrier, then we can truly create something that will enable us to give a stronger and much more effective protection to cyber networks, to IT networks, to OT devices, to everything based on computers. We can create environment completely free from attackers. We will prevent the attackers the foothold in our environment, uh, but we need to think different. We need to take everything out of the box. We need to radically shift the way that we are thinking, and we need to meld it together in a way that will not hamper or interfere with the current operation, but will drastically disrupt everything that the attackers can do in the past, in the future, and in the present. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, this is Akshay Garkel, partner and leader, Grand Fountain Bharat. Uh, the topic that I'm essentially uh, going to speak uh, for this session is on vision for security and uh, technology risk management, uh, which includes the key trends that we have seen so far and uh, uh, the uh, predictions as well. The year 2020 and 2021 essentially has witnessed uh, really complex and potent cyber attacks, especially at the time, you know, when, uh, you know, we were going through very trying times uh, during the COVID-19 surge. Uh, we've also seen that critical infrastructure, government and health sector were overwhelmed given the high volumes of cases. Uh, the dependency on digital infrastructure actually increased multifold and physical movement of people and goods had to really, really get restricted. The cyber posture of organizations also got really stretched uh, to the maximum with the hybrid model of working uh, becoming the new norm uh, with most of the organizations. It was likely that these trends are going to continue and get further complex, right? Given the global uncertainties in current times, uh, which means that you know we have uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, we have economic crisis, we have the surge happening in different countries, uh, and you know uh, there are newer variants. Uh, of uh, the pandemic essentially, which is looming large across multiple geographies. So what are we really seeing today, right? Uh, from, from a digital perspective, from a cyber perspective, we are seeing that, you know, boards today of large organizations have started considering cyber as one of the top three risks affecting business, which is actually being expected to become the top risk. And the reason why I say that, because earlier cyber compromise to cyber postures used to lead to uh, brand protection issues, uh, the customer uh, satisfaction issues, or even the sentiment in the market uh, or, the, uh, or the stock exchange. However, today, uh, with all the advanced solutions like IoT, AI, ML uh, coming in, cyber has actually started affecting and impacting the way of life. If you look at, for example, compromise to a biomedical device can actually avert critical surgeries. Uh, in addition to that, we've also seen connected cars, right? A hack into a connected car can actually lead to a fatal accident and so on and so forth. And based on which we see that today, cyber is actually impacting lives. So in addition to that, uh, businesses are also transforming. Uh, the country is actually seeing the unicorn age. Uh, we have, we are expecting about 200 odd unicorns uh, basically getting added into into our country uh, with based on certain fundings which are happening. When we see that business transformation is happening at a rapid pace, uh, we've also seen you know business to customer 
models are actually moving towards digital to customer models financial companies are also transforming into technology companies by leveraging technology towards financial inclusion we are also seeing that the regulatory obligations are getting further stringent and specific to each entity given the nature of their business mobile applications essentially have been ruling the roast with apps catering to for almost all our daily needs we've seen security considerations are turning all the more critical for applications which basically have a heavy use of apis uh, apis essentially for uh, interconnections between other applications interconnection between other businesses interconnection between different models uh, also basically looking at the payment ecosystem and how the applications essentially are integrating with the other payment ecosystem again with the use of apis we are also seeing that cyber risk is not only associated to systems now uh, or departments or even organizations but it's actually very very severe from a threat standpoint uh, to nation states and human lives and that is something that i had already spoken about um, so for example we saw the mumbai power grid issue uh, which is very common the stuxnet iran's nuclear nuclear power plant issue which essentially and then i gave an example of surgery in uk uh, because of a compromise to a biomedical device was actually averted and it was a very critical surgery we have also seen that today cyber services across the world are growing uh, at a rampant pace given the demand for cutting edge solutions uh, and also you know expert advisory services across domains right from governance to strategy uh, to audits uh, to looking at uh, you know the vulnerability management postures to looking at uh, you know building crisis management plans identity and access management solutions uh, of course cloud uh, adoption is very high and based on that uh, uh, aligning with the right amount of security from a cloud security perspective uh, and of course uh, looking at business continuity and uh, uh, integrated compliance perspectives as well just to basically highlight some of the statistics uh, that you know we we've uh, been seeing in terms of the global spend on cyber uh, we've seen that you know there has been a spend on information security risk management technologies and services which predominantly uh, was predicted to grow by 12.4% and touched uh, 150 billion dollars us dollars in 2021 and if you look at the indian cyber services market uh, that actually grew two times to uh, from 2019 to 21 Uh, in 2019 it was 4.3 billion dollars and in 2021 uh, this is 8.5 billion dollars these statistics essentially have been published uh, in one of the reports issued by data security council of india so let's look at what are some of the challenges essentially that uh, that run across for security programs and risk management programs uh, we've seen political challenges we've seen digital adoption as a challenge and we also seen organization culture right now let's go to political from a political standpoint we've seen the interventions or internal workings of the function uh, we've seen stringency on regulatory compliances on the digital adoption the challenges that we've seen essentially are the security metrics are not unified across the board uh, we've also seen a lack of uh, again a well defined security framework and on the organization culture we've seen uh, certain challenges like Uh, you know what are the priorities that are defined by the senior management of the organization and of course the resistance to change uh, where we always say that change is the only constant uh, across any business now let's look at some of the trends and the predictions you know that effect, uh, effectively uh, you know impact the security posture of organizations the times to come may only be prevalent and may even uh, need even uh, higher uh, security controls to kind of right uh, we've always seen uh, we've seen organizations have declared perpetual work from home even in the future uh, and from that standpoint uh, you know a fair degree of distributed computing uh, will be something that is going to kind of be more prevalent we're going to look at endpoint security uh, because today uh, uh, you know the data essentially should become you know device agnostic and device independent so from that perspective as well how do we apply the security controls at the end point so that there is no pilfer uh, you know there are remote employees who are essentially working on their own devices 
uh, and again from that perspective what are the security controls that organizations can really enforce onto the endpoint device the next one is on automation and we believe that automation is the key here uh, when you talk about automation you talk about automation across security processes which have been defined across the organization uh, you also look at uh, you know the testing methods on offensive and defensive which where organizations today embark on um, and uh, this is a very common technique which has been used by most of the mature businesses today and hence it is very important to see how much of automation can you bring to bear the next point is on data privacy and protection it is important uh, for organizations to understand what is the personal identifiable information that they are handling today and at the same time where all this information is flowing as we all know we are in the time of collaboration and less of competition so from that standpoint there are a lot of third party ecosystem partners who basically handle the data either they process the data for various organizations so there is a fair bit of chance that you know uh, the personal identifiable information would be floating around hence it is very important for businesses to kind of look at uh, how their business processes are running how do they capture the information and if you look at the entire data life cycle in right from the creation of the data to the handling of the data to actually deletion archival and destruction uh, it is very important to have a control over it when i say control uh, it means that you need to understand where all information is essentially residing and at the same time who's got what level of control and thereby also monitor what sort of accesses have been made to that information and what purposes the next point is on threat to critical infrastructure and i think this is a very pertinent point uh, when you talk about security considerations for large infrastructure assets and then you talk about increased adoption of technology in critical processes these are the two points that essentially will be important for organizations to embark on when it comes to the threats to critical infrastructure then of course we've seen some advanced solutions where organizations have already started embarking on the artificial intelligence machine learning space uh, which is essentially going to be extremely important today organizations have gone completely digital uh, they have gone into a lightweight lightweight model where they kind of moving into the digital shelving space as well especially when you look at some of the fintechs so you look at some of the micro segmentation organizations and startups as well uh, some of the retail organizations too hence more and more usage of uh, ai ml is going to be the key uh, the next one is on supply chain and today supply chain is a very very big topic uh, and we've seen uh, right from your distribution network to your inventory management network uh, or you basically look at your payment ecosystem partners uh, or essentially you look at any other models which essentially contribute to supply chain uh, strongly believe that supply chain security is going to be the way forward it is we're going to be very very important to actually understand where all the data flows uh, what are the threats and how do you basically go about you know protecting the threats however before even you talk about protection i think profiling is going to be a very important topic uh, and from a profiling standpoint how do i essentially you know profile my uh, supply chain partners uh, how do i essentially uh, when i'm running the predictive analysis how do i basically fine tune my false positives uh, at the same time you know uh, all the assets which basically form a part of my supply chain how am i going to make sure that i kind of uh, secure them uh, through a risk based approach uh, the next one is on the regulations and compliances can be very very sure that uh, scrutinies are only going to increase controls are only going to be tighter as we move forward now let's look at some of the other points uh, i think the another point is on the board and the organization perspective uh, you know it is very important to justify value to the board on security investments uh, and of course communicating the value of security to the end stakeholders i think that's going to be very very important this trend has already started uh, you know in the beginning of my discussion i mentioned that uh, we going to have the boards of organizations who have already started treating cyber as the top third top three risk uh, but again don't be surprised if cyber becomes the top risk again people uh, as we say that our security is as strong as our weakest chain and uh, i would say standards look at people as uh, the weakest chain and it is very important to kind of make sure that uh, you know that weakness is kind of controlled uh, hence looking at more of a uh, litmus test in terms of testing the 
awareness levels of people also looking at the skill levels of people so more and more skilled professionals will be the need of the r uh, of course insider threat is again a very big risk and insider threat also has to be covered in terms of monitoring the act- activities of the people uh, zero trust is another area uh, where you know uh, no accesses are given and then essentially based on the layered approach accesses are enabled uh, access control is one area in the zero trust of course the architecture uh, you know uh, you know the architecture the availability uh, the integrity uh, privacy all of those aspects also have to be taken into consideration while building a zero trust environment however you know when we look at zero trust zero trust is something which uh, is more of a concept uh, and not a specific product or you know a framework alone right it's a, it's a thought process in terms of how do you invoke it's basically a cultural a uh, perspective that you invoke into the organization of course you know with uh, some of the lessons learned through uh, covid pandemic in terms of the way businesses have realigned and reengineered themselves uh, i think force major is another area which will be very very important as a trend to be watched out for uh, geopolitical tensions uh, is another area uh, so from that perspective any of the attacks which are state sponsored and very very sophisticated uh also need to make sure that you know we have enough uh, weaponry from a business standpoint for example we have seen today that uh, uh, in the in the in the wake of certain tensions between two countries uh, the attack cyber attack scenarios have only grown based on that many businesses have actually become a part of a broadcast attack uh, and because of which you know it was important for businesses to realign their line of defense realign their strategy in terms of looking at the use cases and then realign the strategy of actually going about identifying the nature of the attacks so honey pots offensive are some of the methods which potentially can help here these are some of the trends uh, that you know i discussed and i spoke about uh, therefore in summary you know i would like to emphasize once again that the cyber threat landscape is ever expanding Uh, we have organizations which kind of need to align their processes to global standards on cyber and of course the information security risk uh, the budget and the resource allocations uh, you know need to be revised and then accordingly prioritized uh, we've seen that you know cyber training of staff and education of user community needs more focus now uh, we also understood that organizations need to devise a dedicated framework for cyber uh, which aligns right from the board to the end point and of course instills a complete cyber aware awareness culture within the organization with that i would like to thank you for uh, patiently hearing me and uh, uh, thank you so much hello friends welcome to all for this uh, global security summit i have with me several industry stalwarts and this panel is going to discuss an important uh, topic on the integrated security architecture and approach uh, which has become very much relevant today uh, particularly because of the increased risks which we are seeing in the remote uh, access uh, kind of an environment which we were all uh, perhaps thrown into uh, because of the pandemic even otherwise of course uh, security is something which we try to improve every time whether there is a pandemic or not and um, as attackers keep on um, becoming more and more intelligent we also have to uh, move forward uh, so this is a continuing uh, race now we all started uh, with uh, security basically with uh, the technology tools because after all we were uh, having information security and we had to protect it through information related uh, devices uh, only um, in fact we actually improved the technology to such an extent that uh, very soon we tried to bring in artificial intelligence and other automated security devices uh, so that um, 
possibility of uh, errors and omissions which uh, uh, could be um, uh, i mean uh, uh, there if uh, entire thing is handled by uh, humans would be reduced but then the cycle has again gone forward now we are again thinking whether uh, we should completely eliminate the human uh, intervention or we should uh, uh, bring it back uh, so that the human intelligent uh, person will use the tools and get the integrated security which we want which uh, could be perhaps better than the multi factor uh, security uh, designing which we might have used somewhere uh, in between so to discuss this very interesting topic um, i have with me um, mr sachin jain mr uh, uh, sinha mitali sharma manoj uh, nazim halder and ravi uh, i will not uh, uh, take the uh, liberty of introducing each of these stalwarts i would rather like each of them to uh, very briefly introduce themselves uh, uh, before we start with our uh, session maybe we can start with mr sachin jain because he occupies the left most uh, uh, position <laughs> okay yeah, probably at the wrong place yeah uh, hi uh, everyone uh, my name is sachin jain i am the co-founder ceo and cto at cognis uh with the uh, operations in canada and india and before this i was uh, at evaluserv uh, in the capacity of global cio and ceo i worked there for almost 21 years and uh, yeah so far it's going interesting uh, in the cyber security domain thank you mr uh, sina hi uh, i'm suva prata sina suva to all my friends and pretty much everyone in the industry i am the chief information security officer of nxp semiconductors which is a global semiconductor leader which focuses on um si- silicon solutions with a focus on security and we are present in europe us and with manufacturing facilities in asia as well um yeah my 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 role there primarily is around security strategy and 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 protecting the enterprise thank you thank you mitali can go ahead yeah uh, hi everyone my name is mitali sharma and i head the risk compliance and information security at sdg corporation uh, been in the industry for almost two decades and uh, right now you know as sachin also mentioned there is a lot going on in the cyber security space so managing that for the organization thank you anoj Hi everyone this is Manoj Srivastava um CISO and DP for Future Generally India Insurance so I'm primarily responsible for information and cyber security and data privacy for the organization thank you thank you Nasim Hi myself Nasim Nasim Halder I am CISO of Ecogen Insurance and managing the cyber security information security related uh, enterprise risk for Ecogen Insurance thank you Mr Ravi Hello everyone this is Ravi Hirolikar I am the global CISO for Aquin Financials been in the industry for more than 25 years and have seen a lot happening in the cyber space over the years looking forward to the panel discussion Thank you friends uh, just uh, to add my own uh, brief introduction uh, I am actually not a CISO uh, I category i come from the data protection area of course i was a banker earlier and uh, then uh, moved into cyber loss and uh, presently in uh, data protection i am the chairperson of uh, fdppi foundation of data protection professionals in india um, so we are trying to actually prepare data protection officers to actually challenge all of you cisos <laughs> in the corporate uh, hierarchy okay uh, but it's uh, interesting to have all of you uh, here um to discuss this very uh, important uh, topic um so i think we should start with understanding or uh, defining the scope of our discussion by defining the concept 
See, what we call as this integrated security approach, let us spend a few minutes on understanding what is this um, integrated security approach and how does it differ from any other security approach. I think uh, once we are clear with that, our uh, audience will also be able to appreciate the further discussions which will uh, follow. I think we should start with Mr. Sina on this particular uh, uh, question. That is, how do we define the concept of uh, the integrated security approach in your uh, say perception? Thank you. The concept of integrated security approach, I think, is simple to explain, but difficult to execute, like most things that try to simplify complex constructs. So the way I look at it is that security in most enterprises, so unless you are a startup which has been born in the last 18 months, right? I mean, you, are, you have a legacy. You have factories, you have businesses, you have supply chains, you have users all over the country or even the world. So you have a legacy. And as in any organization, security investments and security initiatives that get built up in layers over a period of time. And that keeps adding on to complexity. It cumulatively starts becoming more and more complex. Also, the organization tends to uh, organize themselves. The teams tend to be the, the organizational hierarchy, the team structure, everything tends to get set, focusing on either technologies or individual functions. And that starts creating its own silos. So the approach to integrated security is to be boundaryless in how we look at security. That's for to start thinking from two different points of view. Number one, think from the point of view of the attacker. We care about our departments, our products, our you know our hierarchies. Attackers don't give a damn. They all they see is an organization may be badly protected and something valuable that they can steal. That's all that they care. They will take the shortest path to the pot of gold and they don't care about our architecture, our uh, infrastructure, our hierarchies. So we have to start thinking like an attacker, which means we have to see holistically and that's where integrated security approach comes in. Second, which is probably also very germane to today's discussion, is to take the point of view of the user. How does, what does the user do? What is the user persona? How does she work? Where does she work? What are the common user behaviors? And once we put ourselves in the user shoes, we start looking at security very differently. Again, it is very simple, but typically this information security profession has designed tools and processes to make our life simple and conversely, often the user's life complicated. You make the user's life high friction, difficult to do things. And then we are surprised that, oh, the users don't appreciate us, right? Because we have not taken an integrated, holistic, user-centric approach to how security should be done. And to me, that's, that's the opportunity for how, we look, how I look at integrated security. Look at it holistically, move from the complex to the simple, reduce Thank entropy. You. Thank you. Thank you. We will have another view, maybe from yeah. uh, Mr. Manoj. Uh, I'll come back to you, Sachin. I, okay. I will actually try to go around uh, all the people uh, as much as possible. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Manoj, uh, can you add uh, your uh, thoughts to this uh, concept of integrated uh, security approach? We talk of layers and uh, then components. So just to try to give some thoughts to people like us to understand uh, how does this multi-layered system uh, contribute to uh, this integrated approach yeah thanks thanks it's uh, you know great question and uh, um, i am in complete agreement with subos uh, uh, moving from complex to simple uh, just uh, would like to add few things on that uh, the first thing of uh, you know integrated security approach is educating the uh, you know uh, stakeholders i mean uh, we have different business functions we have developers, they develop, uh, you know, for business and then certainly th things come to security for do VAPT and all. 
and then we have you know n number of reasons to block the service and thereby business so if security not only do assessment and help organization to you know minimize risk but also educate the stakeholders i mean business it uh, for example it was a case of software development then bringing in secure coding practice in culture bringing in software development life cycle management that will minimize the risk to over, overall risk to organization and that is a you know very basic thing uh, to educate the employees and stakeholders uh, it is nowadays it is not only security by design but it's also privacy by design because uh, i'll give an example like uh, uh, maybe you are going to install any application in your mobile all the norms of secure coding practice stlc are followed but what data i am capturing from end user that also should be need to know basis if i don't require you know uh, full command on the camera or the sms or the you know media of the mobile why should i and that is uh, you know secure uh, privacy by design so i i think integrated security approach is not only securing device or data in terms of confidentiality integrity but availability but also in terms of privacy and both collaborate security and privacy together as a integrated security approach in the current era where you know a lot of dependency uh, we have on digitization and online channels okay, thank you sachin you want to add uh, no. yes uh, yeah. slavi thanks uh, and while i agree with what manoj and uh, suva said uh, i'll just uh, maybe add something on top of what suva was mentioning uh, see if we look at uh, all those legacy organizations they have evolved from a from a perimeter network to a borderless network and uh, and traditionally we have seen uh, the perimeter uh, controlled network data centers now if we see over the period of time the different components i mean pandemic is obviously has expedited a lot of other uh, projects and initiatives but if you look at uh, even before pandemic Uh, cloud has taken its own space remote working was happening and and if we see devops uh, like manoj mentioned and we have so many options these days where people are actually using components from different facets of uh, the technology architecture and if we combine that all together uh, that's actually called the integrated security approach because you have you still have the perimeter to manage you still have the cloud to manage you have then devops security you have then all those remote users who have actually added a uh, lot more security related challenges and as soha was mentioning i think attackers need a sweet spot and that sweet spot can be a can be a user who's sitting at home and using a weak uh, uh, internet uh, at home and and if that user has some access privileges which can be elevated to get control of your network then then it's all compromised irrespective of how good you are at security and how maybe how much you have invested that that doesn't make uh, much sense but you have to look at the security and as a complete uh, and integrated approach where you have to look at all people process and technology uh, as those uh, traditional and important pillar but uh, you have to look at that all all those all those layers as you were mentioning and that's that defines in the the current scheme of things how you actually look at those things to avoid any any any, any risk thank you uh, i like you were uh, describing it as uh, an integration of the people process and technology different uh, uh, elements now uh, uh, let me try to find out from mitali about uh, what do you think are the components of this uh, integrated uh, security system so um, i think uh, a lot of it sachin and uh, mr sinha they have already covered it so i think uh, when it comes to the elements of an integrated security approach i think first and foremost you need to understand what is your landscape what is your current threat landscape like what all are the areas where you see risks to the organization like with uh, you know it's an agile world and with the changing things like you moved on from a normal working area to a remote working environment so those th threat landscape those threat vectors they have completely changed so it's very important first to understand what you need to protect what are those crown jewels of the organization that you really need to protect what are those those controls that you need to have in place where all my data is residing whether it is 
whether it is coming from sock whether it is coming from knock whether it is from dlp and and you know every endpoint right now every user has become a custodian of your information so every user's machine has now become a data center for you rather than just restricting it to that perimeter security whether you know your applications are moving to cloud so it's very important first to understand where all that data is residing what is the threat landscape risk risk landscape of my organization then you need to go ahead and build the controls and defenses around it rather than you know just thinking that okay maybe a uh, a uh, uh, nac would be helpful for my organization or dlp might be helpful for my organization or just setting up a soc would be would be important rather than that it's important that you first see whether it really is needed for my organization or not or maybe you know uh, it's just that i need to have maybe more of awareness within my employees so that they become the custodians of that information and they understand the risks maybe i need to have just the uh, uh, you know the fish- phishing simulations going on or protect myself from having the right kind of backup recovery and restoration procedures or the business continuity procedures in place so i think that's where you need to first understand your threat landscape then look at how you can get that integrated security approach in place and have a holistic view from a ciso standpoint you can get that holistic view of the compliance posture of the organization i think that would be my take on what is needed to start for the integrated approach mr nasim actually we sometimes talk of um, adaptive authentication in terms of uh, particularly the banking industry um, of course authentication is always an important component of uh, any security and um, we uh, even reserve bank of india has spoken about this adaptive authentication essentially meaning that in the real time you have to decide what kind of factors you use for the authentication and don't stick to something which even the attacker knows this is the process of uh, authentication so keeping that in mind now how does this adaptive authentication uh, sink into this concept of uh, uh, integrated security approach can you elaborate on uh, this a little sure sure so uh, before i start let let me share a one fun fact about the word security i hope you know all of you will uh, you know have uh, you know have, have some more you know uh you know i would say enjoy this thing so if you see the spelling of security you know if you balance it first three words is sec and the last three word is ity right so in, in between you will get your so that's a fun fact security is not complete till the time your activity your participation is not there so that's that's the you know basic of security so understand these things and that is that is what you know we are talking about the integration or integrated security now talking about the adapted uh, access management so you know it's depend on how exactly i have designed my architecture let's see if i talk about company like echo who is born in complete uh, complete cloud born company like i don't have you know i think shubhrata might spoke about legacy definitely everybody is having certain legacy everybody is having certain problem but it's totally depend on how exactly you have designed your architecture if i talk about you know company like echo uh in uh, in our hr policy they have a policy that you know if anybody wants they can have uh, at least you know two months three months time work from home and that is before the pandemic so that is what you know you your approach your adaptive uh you know when when this kind of policy you are enabling for the organization you have to have this kind of control to implement in your architecture so if i talk about echo then we have you know jta solution we have already have you know jta architecture is already implemented zero trust architecture so i don't trust any any i don't want that any of my users should you know remember their laptop's password they should remember their you know password of n number of other application i only trust you as a as, as a user only from a one device which is assigned to you uh or i would say whatever doid device we have assigned to you we are we are recognized we are approved those things so uh, you know password definitely one thing uh, additionally we can have you know second factor authentication to having a adaptive authentication because you know it's a password it can be it can be hacked right it can be uh i would say the chances of hacking password comparing you know having a second factor is much more lesser if you have a uh you know adaptive uh, authentication like you have giving a otp right even you have to think like you are asking your 
people to give a great expense to your customer then in the same time it's your responsibility what kind of expense you are giving to your employees right if you are not you know enable the best technology uh, you know solution or best digital solution for them they will not able to think that what is what is going on in the market right so it's all about experience how exactly you are giving how exactly they are adopting so if if i don't want to remember any password i don't want to check anything i want to access i will check my OTP. I will check my authentication app. I will put that you know code six a six digit or eight digit, and I will get my login. So it will be much easier. You know, if the acceptability of having this kind of architecture is you know I would say it's very easy for any any CISOs to implement. Yes, there will be challenge. Uh, I would say acceptability from the user level. Yes, there will be challenges in terms in terms of your architecture in terms of. uh your crown jewel how exactly you want to protect so this need lot of uh, analysis lot of back and forth will happen but that i think that is the best approach for adoptive authentication yeah uh, so ravi actually nasim actually spoke about uh, this um, multiple factors uh, like uh, the otp and other things but uh, nowadays people talk of using gps location rfid devices um, even video Uh, monitoring for example when we want to do kyc online uh, we uh, actually expect uh, some kind of a uh, video a selfie kind of a thing to be shown kind of a thing and um, when we start using uh, this uh, kind of remote uh, uh, systems for more complicated or more critical uh, applications so like today we are even having court proceedings uh, on um, uh, camera or something like that so apart from the well known uh, let us say the otp kind of uh, uh, authentication um, what else do you think uh, is essential to actually make this uh, remote authentication uh, more robust there are multiple uh, technologies and uh, you know implementations available one is the risk based authentication or adaptive authentication based on the user profile the risks perceived you know the uh, type of applications that you are accessing you know it could throw multiple additional factors that could be one way i think and uh, of course in the current uh, remote setup for organizations definitely we need to look at uh, you know as a mandatory control you must have multi factor authentication and uh, there you can have a certificate based authentication you can have an otp kind of a, a model so all multiple uh, you know uh, implementations are possible uh, and going back to your uh, i think the first question about integrated security approach uh, while i definitely agree with uh, my co panelists on uh, you know the understanding with different connotations of the terminology i look at it from the board's perspective right as a as a board uh, they would ask a ciso is my data safe is my network safe and are we resilient right so i i look at these main three risks that the board would ask and anything any you know uh, perspective of implementation that would answer these questions uh, you know is an integrated approach so i cannot say for example that my on prem uh, setup is secure but my cloud setup is not i cannot say that my enterprise controls are robust but my supply chain is weak i cannot say that i have my end users uh, you know aware but my leadership is not going through awareness training so integrated approach would look at all those aspects and of course on on consolidating as many tools as possible in in terms of managing the security controls just wanted to add that yeah thank you i'm uh, interested in uh, discussing at least one example uh, for example uh, we all are aware of uh, the uber uh, auto car accident no that auto driver uh, car accident in arizona okay um and uh, people have been discussing what went wrong uh, in this particular uh, car accident because it involved uh, the uh, perhaps i don't know a failure of sensors um failure of the software which converted the uh, inputs from the sensors into a mechanical uh, braking uh, decision um and this was one in, uh, kind of an integrated system where it was 
not only the software which was involved in the decision making the external inputs which were coming perhaps uh, through the uh, connectivity uh, systems which were there plus there was a human being sitting behind the wheel who was part of the security that is the whole system was supposed to have triggered uh, some kind of an alert so that when necessary the human had to also intervene so this was a classic example of a system which had uh, let us say the remote uh, uh, input of data then uh, software working uh, both within the car maybe on the uh, cloud also and the human so if this is considered as an integrated uh, system and we are looking at managing the security of such a system now how do you react to uh, being let us say ceo of uh, this uber project and say where do we identify our uh, weaknesses mr sachin i think is the uh, person who has to who has to go ahead with uh, yeah. his view point <laughs> yeah, i think uh, having uh, my window as a first person on the talent yeah so but uh, yeah i uh, when i when you were talking about that accident i was actually thinking how ai is playing a role in uh, in the security uh, framework and uh, and as uh, security and ai both are actually see a different maturity curve and uh, and you're right i mean the, there are systems which can throw a lot of data on you and and as we know now uh, because of a uh, lot of uh, you can say uh, tools technologies and and because of this this expanded shape of the uh, the security framework there is lot of data which is getting generated and is humanly impossible to track and analyze all this data you need actually machine you need all those automation to make sense of that data correlate that data and throw some meaningful uh, results to you which can again further either you can take that further to aut- uh, automate it maybe uh, as a next step where you apply some decision making based on that data and again there are combination either you involve human intelligence to take those decision or you take a uh, machine to take the to take that decision and what happens uh, i mean we have seen and there is obviously uh, a lot of research going on if we if we completely rely on machine and even in this case of let's say security if we decide let's say if there is an attack and you need to block what if this is going to be a false positive and what if it has a huge impact on your business i mean we are talking about an accident and that accident can be maybe shutting off a business and and maybe leading to millions of dollars of revenue loss you need to bring that intelligence where to block what kind of decision has to be taken and i think we are at a stage where uh this human intelligence and and a machine intelligence has to coexist and and i think time will tell us uh, uh, we, uh, we don't know whether in our lifetime or maybe in uh, maybe maybe our kids will see probably this maybe a, a glorified and maybe a more mature automation in this place which can actually bring uh, a perspective which is not just a, a traditional ai but uh, is more of a neural science into it and and bringing that the kind of decision making yeah uh, now we will go to manoj i have got a specific uh, question uh, of course as a follow up uh, for this uh, uh, uber uh, incident and also in many smart city projects law enforcement projects we have got multitude of uh, cctvs and some human being has to interpret those things and uh, uh, today we are trying to uh, have artificial intelligence interpret and at least throw up um, something which needs to be um, looked at by a human being secondly uh, sometimes we feel that uh, uh, the uh, there is a privacy issue when you are uh, having surveillance and therefore it is always better that the first layer of filtering is done uh, by the system um, so that we don't know who is uh, walking here and there or something like that but if there is a suspicious um, moment uh, by gate analysis or something like that the software detects that or the facial recognition then it escalates it to a human being so that the combination of the uh, system and the human being comes in there in fact uber was also one such thing where they had designed the system in such a manner that 
at least on this test drive there was a human sitting and he would perhaps react and break if necessary and i was um, going through one of the recent um, say studies uh, on the us election system particularly the postal ballot system i don't know whether uh, you had an occasion to look at it they had thrown up uh, a concept called visual cognitive fatigue okay that is you put a human being to look at the screen and then perhaps come up with uh, some action at the appropriate time um uh, say 99.5% or more time he does not have to do anything so only that half a percent uh, it is required that is where this fatigue uh, uh, comes in so when you are creating an integrated system particularly a system which combines the um, i mean software Uh, along with the human intervention uh, manoj uh, what kind of challenges we uh, face to avoid the security failures of the type uh, we have seen in this uber accident uh, well so uh, my submission would be see if we are losing data if there is a data breach or compromise that can be acceptable but if we are losing human beings that cannot be acceptable i mean this is a you know unrecoverable loss so uh, and and the second thing is if everything is uh, you know defined in sops and can be automated we don't need human intelligence at all we, we could have deployed robots everywhere robot x ceo of y company no we in fact require you know human intelligence and definitely ai and ml these things can add value to take some good decision by human beings it should not be in other way around okay yeah so so that's the important thing and when it comes that we are into very sensitive design where you know iot's sensors softwares are you know uh, working with each other to take some decision i mean uh, and some analytics into action then up to certain layer because if we have 1000 cars suppose 1 lakh 1 million cars and if the false positive is 0.5% still we have chance of dying 500 person every hour and that is of course you know not acceptable so there has to be some break glass process and there should not be any kind of single point of failure and and security is you know confidentiality integrity and availability we 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 don't uh, actually you know look into that the system so our uh, information may not be confidential for me but that may be confidential for somebody else so, like you know we are into 31st march if my balance sheet is not published that is very sensitive but once it is published it is available in public so like that way you know we have to we have to you know implement applied security i mean we have uh, you know n number of security if you implement everything the security budget will in, you know increase uh, will go more than it budget but there has uh, something uh, you know applied security if it is iot if it is software decision making then uh, you know the so- the productivity the security and the uh, you know uh, credibility of software has to be tested integration maybe you know the car is running at the speed of 100 and someone suddenly comes in if it takes maybe 2 second to take some decision that 2 second is not acceptable because human brains work in nanosecond to stop the car so that kind of foreseen and unforeseen scenarios and when anal- analytics is coming into action what kind of you know uh, uh, you know impact is going uh, for, from that uh, you know decision that has to be you know properly taken care of and you rightly said that yeah uh, it it add values uh, you know at, to certain layer you know in protecting privacy like you know we have a lot of cctv cameras in society here and there uh, then smart concept of smart cities and all so definitely you know ai and ml add a lot of values uh, like you know i were going through a lab uh, where you know in a tall bridge a lot of vehicles were crossing but suddenly they found one vehicle which was you know very new okay and it it is going to some railway station and the, in the railway station a face was very new so the system uh, you know given alert to the you know human being that this face is you know looking suspicious we haven't seen this face 
in last 10 years we could not find it in our database there was a vehicle then automatically they started tracking and finally there was some connection and it was a terror attack kind of it was simulated lab but yes uh, it was pa possible even in lab because of you know artificial intelligence so so a proper balance is very much important and uh, we should not rely only on the artificial intelligence or machines when it comes on the life of human i think you have highlighted the, that uh, our decision to integrate and the depth of integration we want to have should also take into view what will be the impact whether it will be a critical life uh, threatening critical. impact or not and then take a decision fine now if we look at an organization now let us now look at um, as a ceo what are the key drivers which you feel um, uh, make you think about changing the current legacy system whatever you are adopting into a higher level next generation uh, information security system including this particular uh, uh, concept of this integrated security approach i think uh, mitali can uh, say something on uh, that as an organizational head of a ceo when do you think uh, you will have to move ahead from the legacy system into this kind of an integrated systems so what are the examples or the drivers so i would again say the same thing the first and the foremost for me would be the changing threat landscape so let's say you know if my organization earlier everybody was sitting in an infrastructure in a facility which was uh, monitored which was you know they they were in a in a facility which was secured now if suddenly everybody has moved on i mean pandemic came in and everybody moved on to remote working so which means that you know we need to relook at how we used to have our security framework we need to relook at the tools technologies that were implemented within the organization not just the tools and technologies but also the processes that were followed for example you said in physical security that if tailgating is going to happen this is the this is you know this is the penalty or this is the uh, disciplinary action that you would take now what would you do if somebody is working from home they are working on their laptops and you know a family member comes in and peeps into the information what would you do to that so you know those kinds of relook at the complete security landscape relook at complete tools technologies that were being used everything moved on to cloud all of a sudden like you know some things which were on prem people decided and accelerated that movement and moved things to cloud so it becomes very important that now your identity access management moves from just being on prem to the cloud security you need to relook at the vendors that are giving you cloud security so that way you know the entire landscape entire security posture that the way you were measuring it it completely changes in a way uh, you know the the awareness training which was just maybe in some organizations it was just a check in the box saying that yes we have our organizations aware we have the employees aware now you really need to have those employees aware and you need to have those efficient controls to understand how much aware the employees are that could be moving into a zone where uh, you start doing certain phishing simulations and testing how much are my employees secure how much my employees know about it once you have done that i mean whatever controls you implement either you have already been breached or you would be breached in in the next few days so that's that's the the current situation of cyber security that i would say in your organization so first of all as a ceo uh, i think it's very important that i accept this fact that this is what is going to happen or this is something that has happened so uh, it's important like uh, manoj ravi they also pointed out that the very most important thing that the executive management would ask the ceo would be uh, is my data secure and how resilient i am so it becomes very important that you know those uh, those uh, in incident response plans those data breach response plans that you had from a very long time have you revisited them and have you really tested them or they are just the ones on paper do the people really know what they should do when a cyber incident happened or uh, do they really know how to reduce the impact of a particular uh, risk that is going to happen so that it does not end up leaving you in in a re reputational loss in a in a financial loss or in the loss of life so i think those would be the aspects that i would think should be considered thank you we will go to swagrata again um see mitali highlighted the increasing risk because of this uh, remote uh, work situation so 
one of the things which come along with this remote uh, workforce is uh, that they are using their own devices uh, okay so your control on the device uh, to some extent is reduced in fact even when you perhaps considered a byod at least you had one environment in which you had much better uh, say visibility than uh, for, uh, this home based uh, uh, environment so we are uh, in a situation where there is a increasing importance to the endpoint security in fact i am rem reminded that in one of the rbi's uh, documents they said endpoint security is the responsibility of the bank okay now i want you to actually react to how much of responsibility for endpoint security can be taken by the organization uh, like perhaps i don't know uh, you you know what are the solutions and other things but uh, let us uh, hear from you so in in today's uh, cloud centric world and you know situation where many many users are remote and we want them often to be remote right think of sales people they by default have to be remote right and historically we probably under invested and now we are the tools that we are thinking of securing remote users can secure our sales people as well so endpoint security is probably one of the most fundamental tenets of a holistic integrated security architecture um other being identity security so so yes we organizations have to take accountability for endpoint security yes if it is a company owned asset it is a lot easier there are tools that are available today that can give a good deal of balance between security and user experience right and um, it becomes a lot more difficult if it's a user owned asset like a user mobile user tablet ipad users own macbook stuff like that and i think that's where the 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 product vendors have made a lot of progress in managing this in a way that is flexible and right? so think of mdm tools like intune and the uh, all the potential that comes with tools like that and it actually allows you to allows the cisos like us and 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 the cios to really think about where do we want to have this balance how much of user friction how much of security how much of smoothness of user experience and what kind of controls can you have that are transparent to the users what kind of controls do you have that you want the users to know that you are introducing these controls a good example is things like admin by request you are not an admin by default but if you want to be at if you want to install something you 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 just you were made an admin for that that period of time things like that so so i think it's it's um it, that balance is now largely possible and security and monitoring can be done fairly transparently to the user but still there is always that residual risk and that is where user awareness becomes so much more important and um, uh, i remember i think um, someone manoj talked about the importance of user awareness right? and it is that can never be wished away we have to do now there are tools for doing phishing simulations microsoft has its own tool and there are startups which are building excellent tools for uh, phishing simulations so uh, training the users to recognize what is a malicious email what is how does it become malicious url how does it recognize a top level domain things like that so so we we have to invest in user awareness because that is the residual risk that will always remain okay thank you we'll go to ravi uh, now we, we have been hearing a lot about uh, zero trust okay architecture or say, system or whatever way you would like to describe how does uh, that system um, relate to what we are discussing today as an integrated uh, security approach or a, a enhanced or next generation security approach uh, uh, okay is zero trust the uh, thing which is uh, uh, perhaps uh, in the forefront or is it just past the prime or what what do you think uh, is the status of zero trust architecture in this uh, security <clears throat> these terminologies you know keep coming in waves i think you know as as the threat landscape evolves zero trust is not a new terminology we always had something called as preventive control or i think in some 
documentation, you would even see a term called preventative control. So when there was uh, there was a time when uh, there was a common you know collective voice which was saying that you know uh, security would come in the way of business. So there should be uh, less of preventive controls, more of detective controls and achieve that balance. But as the threat landscape has become more and more scarier and security breaches have more, become more and more, uh, you know, having devastating impact on businesses, these terminologies have again come back, right? So, and particularly in this particular situation of uh, remote uh, operating model, it becomes very, very pertinent. It becomes uh, very important to be able to say that, you know, I do not trust anything unless I verify, right? So for our security systems, whether it is, let's say, our VPN that admits users into our network or applications or, you know, anything, it is important to verify the identity I think Su Subro, uh, you know, very rightly pointed out that that's an important element of any integrated security architecture, but also look at the posture on device. And that's again, goes back to the previous question about whether organizations should take responsibility for the end user devices, but at least the, to the extent of checking the posture, maybe allowing time for, uh, you know, remediating any weaknesses in the posture. Those kind of things must be done. And I think there are more and more uh, implementations like SASE and you know, Secure Access Service Edge, etc. Those implementations, which include all these uh, you know, layers of defenses, whether it is uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, posture uh, verification, some amount of data protection or data loss prevention, uh, reverse proxy, you know, you name it. All these elements are part of the uh, solutions these days, and I think they're very relevant. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have been discussing, and Ivan Nasubato also has uh, spoke about uh, spoke about this uh, admin by request or something like that. Now, one of the things which I've been uh, discussing uh, in uh, our uh, framework uh, of uh, data protection uh, security. Um, which we call as uh, data protection uh, standard uh, is that the CISO or let us say the DPO, that one single person sitting in the head office of an organization, how far he will be able to exercise a effective control, particularly when uh, the systems are distributed in different uh, places and uh, with this remote uh, uh, handling, uh, each uh, employee is uh, in a different location. So centralized monitoring of security uh, is becoming a challenge. So we have been talking about distributed responsibility. That is, for us, every person um, is the CISO for his domain. Okay. Um, uh, so that as, long, as far as whatever it is the data domain which has been given to him, that person must be responsible. He may be a software developer, code developer. He may say, I am not a CISO. I am not trained in information security. But in the current scenario, every person has to take accountability for information security within his domain is what I have been referring to as distributed responsibility. So Naseem, can you add uh, uh, a thought on whether that is the way to go uh, in future, uh, even if this uh, remote uh, uh, a system of working may come down, but people say that uh, even later, uh, more than 50% of the people will uh, prefer to work only from home even after the pandemic is over. So it becomes almost a permanent uh, requirement. So this concept of not expecting one single person with whatever designation and power uh, to be able to control uh, without much of uh, accountability at every level, um, do you think that is uh, something which we have to think of as the architecture for information security governance? Let us look at it like that. Okay. Yeah, Nasim. <clears throat> so first of all, I will completely agree with your concept. You know, that should be the ideal approach. You cannot have, you know, one person and, you know, he or she might not be a superman or might not have a you know, superpower that he can control everything. It should be distributed. It, we should have, you know, certain security coordinator. We should have... 
you know, certain level of security discussion. Let's say if I talk about uh, any, any insurance company, right? We have various departments. Uh, we have department like claims, we have department like actually, we have department like ops. So every, every, every department, you should have one security spoke. He will be the person or he will be the, your point of contact if something wrong happened and or something they are they are you know thinking that this can be a risk to the organization they should update this thing to the designated person it can be a CISO it can be you know anybody right uh, that CISO course position is mostly I would say somebody at the org level who will drive the force what are the things what are the basic checks we need to do how we can do it if something unusual come he or she will give the expertise to solve or give the expertise to handle the situation. And yes, in the same time, we also need to have one more guy at the, I would say most probably it should be the head of the department, whoever it is, it might be HR guy, it might be a you know, finance guy, it might be ops guy, that hey, this is what we are going to do at the org level and it will be your responsibility to drive the same thing, drive the same control, drive the same process, technology, you know, inform your people about the awareness, what are the things you can do, how you, are, how you can do, and, you know, I, I, I'd say, you know, that should, if, if that is coming from the head of the department, the acceptability will be much more higher compared to, you know, doing a uh, security session or security awareness that, hey, you know, this is what we are doing. Please don't do, you know, do this 10 things, do, do not do these five things. I think that will be, you know, much more effective if it's coming from a top of that, uh, you know, top of that, uh, you know, department. Uh, there are certain more things they can also you know i i think first line is the always the i think the best person who can analyze the risk right because they have the better visibility in terms of business as well and uh, one more thing is that if the top of the line is talking about the risk they will talk about the risk as per their business requirement which is which is help them to refer which is help them to understand how the risk is generating or how the risk is coming from and i have seen one more thing you know adding to that awareness part I would always prefer that, you know, give the awareness at a personal level. Let's see if I'm able to help you how, you know, how you can secure your Facebook account or how you can secure your email account. And if I make sure that what is important in your Facebook account, what are the information you are putting publicly, how I can misuse. If you showcase this thing, believe me, once I will build that habit in myself, I can, I, I, how exactly I'm going to save my own data. Believe me, whenever I will work for any corporate, any organization, I'm going to implement the same thing. So that that should be the, you know, uh, I think that... that yeah. yeah. Now we will go around uh, for one final uh, uh, round with all of uh, you. Basically, yeah, I, I, I actually, Mr. Navi, I, I just have, well, maybe if I, if you can just give me one minute, I'll just add to what Nassim mentioned. Uh, yeah. See, uh, we look at uh, uh, human as the weakest link and and we also look at human as the strongest link in the in the information security chain. And uh, and as you mentioned uh, about the distributed, what I often say, and I used to say at my, my previous organization also, see security is a culture where you have to extend the responsibility to each and everyone in the organization. And while obviously CISO and management can be there as a driver to, to guide and to basically design and, and maintain the framework, but you want each and everyone in the organization to understand the importance of security in relation to the business. Information security can help you um, uh, scale your business and can also uh, be the reason to shut the shop or to bring uh, huge losses. And, and that's where uh, I also used to say it's, it's a moving target. And and more you do, uh, the more challenges will be on your plate. And I think Mitali also mentioned it beautifully that it's, a, it's, a, it's a actually dynamic threat and scale. And, and you can't define what you have to what you have to do. Even let's say for next one year, you can't say this is my one year roadmap. By the time you reach there, you will probably see 10 other challenges. Yep. And that's where while you obviously at the back end, you are struggling with and juggling with all those uh, uh, tools, all those dynamic uh, changes. You want each and every body in the organization to understand the importance and the culture of the security. Thank you. So we'll have uh, a very brief uh, concluding remark from, uh, say, Ravi, um, and uh, followed by Mitali and Manoj um, about uh, anything else you want to say about uh, this particular uh, topic. Yeah, Ravi. 
I I think I completely agree with the co-panelists' thoughts about uh, whether you call people as weakest link or strongest link. I I have always believed, and I have demonstrated in my organization that you know you have a layers of security tools in an integrated approach. You would address in ninety nine point nine nine percent of the threats there that are known to you, but there would still be certain threats that would rely on human intelligence. that the employees need to use their judgment right detect suspicious emails and we have seen that some of those emails did have malicious links or something that uh, that needed to be blocked right so that's why i always call employees as the strongest link in the cybersecurity ecosystem and i think in an integrated approach you know you would need to rely on uh as the organization grows as the events per second grows you know you would rely a lot on technology and uh, automated decision making but you would also rely a lot on specialists skills human intelligence and ability to judge and make decisions thank you punch word from mitali yeah so uh, i think uh, sachin and ravi stole all the points that i had but then uh, you know i think uh, it's very important and i would say that from the experience that i have with my organization i think it's very important whatever processes you have defined for your organization whether they are really just on paper or they are actually being implemented people are aware of it like for example it could be a simple process of you know onboarding a particular employee or it could be a simple process of offboarding a particular employee company exits or just monitoring of your antivirus patching i mean organizations don't take the time to teach the employee why do they need to have these security patches done every month what is this vulnerability management they are doing what is this antivirus because i think if as a employee i know why this is being done on my system uh, i will understand and i'll be a part of that system rather than questioning the system and saying that why this is being done so you know we, from our uh, our experience we have tried to bring that into the culture right from the beginning Uh, when we develop the processes whenever we do that we uh, you know make it a point to make the employees aware of the processes we make it a point that employees can reach out to the compliance team and question that you know we don't understand this process why this is being done because then you know the employees themselves become the custodian of the information they themselves become the owners they take the ownership it's a joint ownership and it is not just the ceo or uh, the board of directors who are responsible for it so everybody becomes a part of that culture and it comes into the dna of the organization so i think that's what is the key that you make them a part of the process have the processes which are effective and which are usable not the processes which are just there to meet certain compliance requirements thank you final word from manoj yeah uh, so there are a lot of things to say but you know uh, the basic thing is uh, now the thought process of ciso should be more on the strategic uh, than only technical i mean uh, the ciso should uh, also appraise leadership and board about in information security in terms of business i mean how i do that uh, you know i i i did some stress test analysis and i converted the risk into uh, risk mapping with solvency and uh, subsequently if we require some additional working capital during that stress time so uh, and then when it comes to cio then some different language i mean uh, multi hatting is required uh, educating employee is uh, you know very important but one thing is also very important that the security is a discipline it's a practice it cannot be for your different for your personal life professional life what i started i started discussing more and more on their personal space like cyber bullying ptm kyc this that now i'm getting good response i only have to launch the training i get 100% completion very soon so i mean the way of work uh, should be a bit different and the fact remains same uh, you know uh, we were not safe we are not safe and we will never be safe so it's always uh, you know good to be resilient than being strong how soon can we detect how soon can we recover last but not least uh, you know uh, the investments should be wise and intelligent i mean there are a lot of technical controls a lot of you know controls available 
you know it's not only about you know bringing in so many products in the organization and making life of user miserable no so the decision the investment should be wise and uh, you know rso rosi has to be calculated and uh, it's not only about implementing the control subsequently you know effectiveness of control has also to be measured thank you thank you friends uh, it has been an interesting uh, uh, discussion i'm sure that uh, there is so much to discuss and so much to talk and uh, uh, time is always uh, uh, not uh, fully available but uh, anyway uh, i'm sure that all the uh, inputs you have given will be a great uh, education for um, all of us who are uh, listening to this and uh, we hope we will have other opportunities to take this discussion further so thank you thank you sachin thank you manoj thank you. nasim uh, welcome all uh, to our panel discussion on application fraud prevention as part of the global security summit uh, and awards 2022 uh, i am anil chipronkar I am a founder CEO of Info Counselors. I am a certified fraud examiner. I am a IRC accredited principal auditor for ISO 27001. I am a certified accounting uh, forensic accounting professional. I am certified anti money laundering expert. I also did diploma in cyber law which can support me for my cyber fraud investigation uh, cases. And I am also a certified data protection professional which is more on the privacy part. Uh, i have close to 38 years of experience uh, in the industry uh, out of which last uh, 20 plus years dedicated to cyber security cyber fraud management and business continuity uh, that's pretty much about me let me hand it over to ravinder for his introduction yeah ravinder thanks anil hi everyone i am ravinder arora global cso for infogain i take care of uh, risk and compliance cyber security and privacy for infogain having around 20 years of experience now and uh, thanks for uh, you know being part of this uh, summit and this panel looking forward for a great discussion thank you okay welcome ravinder let's uh, go to dr deepak yeah hi this is deepak kalamkar i am vp infosec for cfxp i have 24 years of it experience and looking forward for a good session thank you welcome deepak let's uh, hear from kanishk hi everyone i am kanishk kaur i carry more than 14 years of experience in cyber security consulting i specialize in the area of cyber threat intelligence and hunting uh, i'm a graduate from india i got gone a recipient of chevening commonwealth scholarship from the uk government for my work in cyber security and currently completing my phd in cyber security from iim lucknow uh, i look forward to interacting with you all thank you okay great welcome kanesh let's hear from sachin uh, your introduction please yes thank you so much for having me here uh, uh, this is sachin kavalkar i am a global cso for niamo i uh, having 19 plus years of experience currently working in niamo which is a global payroll and hro company organization uh, work with almost more than 10 to 15 countries across the globe and uh, working constantly on information security cyber data privacy various regulations and constantly contributing to the infosec community to strengthen our the standards compliances so looking forward to have a great discussion thank okay, you okay great welcome sachin now when we talk about application fraud there are multiple uh, or rather the range is pretty high right from exploiting the vulnerabilities within the applications probably something like identity theft and trying to use that uh, stolen identity to carry out the frauds then uh, trying to probably release some fake applications or uh, something which we have heard uh, the ransomware kind of thing it's also a kind of application fraud so uh, i i would like to ask uh, ravinder that uh, during your the cyber security and incident management have you, what type of application frauds uh, you have come across and if you can just elaborate few of those areas and what kind of security measures you are really looking forward to uh, control these kind of uh, incidents of frauds sure anil uh, you know definitely i mentioned i think in last 20 years i witnessed so many 
different type of attacks and i think one thing which is very important at this area which is quite neglected as well because most of the time being you know cso's or security administrator we actually focus more on perimeter gateways most of the time we are focused on you know firewall and you know we are implementing controls at you know our network level but i think the most important layer which is the application layer where we forget to implement and you know forget to strengthen most of the time and these attackers actually take advantage of that in last 5 years if you will go for some data i was reading some report for gartner there is a 78% increase in application layer attacks because now you know every time we are using your know, mobile phone we are installing new application there are apis that you know we actually integrate we collaborate with and all this actually take to some bigger security risk the, you know i can tell you one or two uh, which actually made some more headlines in the news i remember in 2014 there was a sequel injection and tesla website where attackers mentioned that they are able to you know get into database and everything because there was a some sql injection vulnerability that exploited another we have to understand application security fraud or application security attacks actually lead to some other attack which is actually identity theft as well you also mentioned very famous attack i remember between 2015 and 2017 Facebook and Google they both were using one Taiwan based vendor Quanta and the Quanta vendor was sending some invoice and one attacker actually imprisoned himself as that vendor sent hundred of invoices got around 100 million of dollars and with the time they actually got to know both companies that he is not the genuine vendor it is some you know identity theft happened that time they were able to lose around 56 million of dollar you know some around that so i think we have to understand i think time has really come that we are focused you know and we all understand the dod model i really don't want to repeat here but i think we have to understand that application security attack or application security fraud actually now leading to some you know a uh, huge financial losses for the organization is really time to implement and strengthen our application security framework and we really have to be careful so uh, this is from my side great great ravinder you touched upon few of those uh, frauds which are already there in the news and uh, yes they are really on the more on the application layer and as you pointed out dod typically we also yeah. used to have this um, ip layer the seven layers and the application yeah. always at the top and uh, normally we as you said we try to implement controls at the firewall level the network level the transmission layer but application layer is is pretty high and uh, typically that is the layer where uh, the u- end users are actually interacting so it is a layer which is open to public and that's where the uh, challenge starts coming in and uh, with this uh, number of these organizations are moving towards uh, digitization more and more applications need to be now in the market at a very fast pace so in in the current fast pace where we are started using this uh, uh, agile sdlc and uh, devops and those kind of methodologies uh where uh, probably the focus of the business users is to have the application up and running very fast rather than spending yes. more time on the security so the inbuilt security controls for uh, the security detection prevention or fraud detection probably are they getting a little overlooked uh, or something of that sort probably i want to go to deepak for uh, looking at this because his main focus is on trying to have safe application to try and Uh, have a safe payment gateway right so deepak your views on this uh... yeah yeah that's right anil you rightly said that uh, business people always want the new developments to put in on urgent basis right. so here also in in our case we can say that this is the same case that the applications are developed they are not tested properly because of the fast processing and before putting into uat they are directly pushed to productions and then we find that when we do the scannings internal scannings we find that there are some vulnerabilities found then we have to tell the support team to resolve the vulnerabilities but till the time we we say that the monitoring part is increasing because of this we have to put on more efforts on monitoring the functionality of the uh, patch which is developed so this takes more times actually so so as, as i was saying during this uh, development are the security requirements which should have been inbuilt 
into the software development are they somewhere looking at a little kind of uh, getting less focus than the actual functionality of the applications and how do you really propose yeah. to address that situation uh yeah rightly said anil uh, they, we are actually for this we are developed we are now implementing crs for this like if the code is going on uh, on the production server the uh, change request must be approved by a uh, tl then only it will go if it is not going for a uat testing then the tl has to approve the things that majority of the patches which are going on to the production server are approved and are seen by the superior persons so the okay. developer doesn't have a right to send the uh, directly to the production so he must raise a cr to avoid the testing he must raise cr and it must be approved by the uh, tls directly good so it's a combination of process and kind of a third party third i view on that entire process and trying yes. to mitigate uh, these concerns great uh, yes so uh, kanish do you want to add something to this uh, related to your experience about uh, the strategy to uh, approach this sdlc and trying to address the weakness right at the source level typically using some kind of a source code scanning or something of that sort so i think uh my approach would be to follow the security by design model where you don't wait for bugs to be detected later by hackers or bug bounty professionals but you take care of security needs while the application is getting designed so this could also be done by training the developers on security best practices so you know sanitizing input parameters looking at uh, ensuring the code is not leaked on github uh, following basic safety protocols in terms of using the right kind of texts uh, uh, ensuring the passwords which are being created they are complex uh, you know those, those would be certain approach and also today there are multiple tools available such as check marks uh, where there is an approach which teaches you how to code securely so if that could be followed that will help and before the actual uh, release of the application if a security assessment is done from a internal team or from a third party that will help salvage the situation because it will help forego the risk which the business might face in the later part so i think that's that's one approach and we've seen that uh, as we move towards new models trust is becoming the paramount aspect uh, right so so when trust becomes paramount uh security by design trust by design are typical models which are getting followed a lot of organizations are also moving towards aspects where they talk about zero trust where they saying yeah. trust nobody not even your vendors and third party part uh, partner <laughs> ecosystem and have checks and balances uh my view is that that will come in if you first have the basic set and right if you follow security best practices then such models will make sense because if Uh, you are already compromised then building up uh, you know zero trust architecture zero trust based model that will not really fly okay very very nicely put kanish so essentially uh, uh, if you really look at the organizations who try to use the security practice as a envelope to their existing uh, infrastructure application then it becomes a little challenge because the security weakness are already present inside the infrastructure and you are just trying to put some wrapper to try and stop somebody to do it but that wrapper if it doesn't hold good then your infrastructure is still weak so the very good point view you brought up was a security by design but in in this entire uh, process i believe uh, when as a cyber security professional when we do the risk assessment specifically while doing this code development we don't really look at the fraud related risk aspects and uh, uh, as part as part of my consulting projects uh, being a fraud examiner uh, over a period of time uh, i have been advising organizations to set up some process about uh, fraud risk management and uh, acfe which is one of the globally recognized organization have really have come up with number of good articles on fraud risk prevention and if we tailor that to application fraud risk prevention probably i think uh, one of these uh, area which you mentioned security by design that can be uh, that can use this fraud risk model and try to build the controls while doing the coding 
and uh, uh, similar testing you can then build into your uh, check marks or vera code or some kind of a tool where when we can try to see, see how the code is secure from a fraud related uh, aspect also so so that's a wonderful uh, point i think uh, now coming to uh, post application implementation till now we have discussed something during uh, application development the sdlc the secure sdlc or nist related framework or microsoft also has released its own framework called microsoft ssdlc that is secure software development life cycle right so considering all this uh, now we are coming to say uh, application is already implemented now it is put to use then uh, how important it will be monitoring it for a fraud uh, detection or prevention purpose uh, i would like to start with deepak and then probably come to uh, kanishk on that uh, yes anil uh, see like i said in my first thing when application is deployed uh, then after application develop uh, is deployed we are uh, into testing we get it for testing so we testing and also in our case we have a application support team which works 24 by 7 who monitors the deployed uh, application the logs are monitored continuously if some fraud ips are coming up we also have a third party sock and sim who monitors 24 by 7 the application servers which are running so if someone is uh, trying to hack the uh, server through any application or open ports in the application, we are alerted with the response. If it is a high response, we get an alert within 10 minutes from the third party. And also our team also alerts us about if some IPs are getting uh, from any, say, banned country, they are trying to access the application. And uh, also we have, some systems in our operation teams who gets the alerts of fraud transactions which are happening and then they deal with with like uh, how to process it they first get to the customer they see if the transaction is fraud then they go to a bank uh, then ask them and if it is a fraud transaction then it is sent to rbi as okay. per rules and regulations okay so post monitoring uh, is account 24 by 7 is, is it important uh, yeah. more from a detection and possibly a prevention perspective so if you find some yeah. trend although the fraud is not actually materialized but you already got some alerts you can try and take some preventive steps on that right yeah that's right great. we can prevent the uh, aim by stopping it great so actually this fraud word i have i have created a long form of that fraud uh, you can say it is a copyrighted to me, <laughs> the long form. I said financial resources acquire using deception. So typically in all frauds, there is somebody who is trying to acquire some financial resources. Then let it be money, let it be uh, shares, let it be anything else, right? So typically there are crimes, but all crimes are not frauds because frauds more related to the finance stuff. So Kanishk, uh, in, in the cyber strategy design for this application uh, related stuff, how uh, you propose to include this monitoring, post implementation monitoring? Uh, how, how you propose to include that? Uh... Sure. So I think uh, elements of doing cyber threat intelligence and hunting will play a very vital role because today yeah. integrators of compromise can be sitting somewhere in the dark web or deep web. There could be hackers who have already compromised your applications and Correct. they could be selling it on dark web. So proactively monitoring whether your data is leaked on uh, different dark web forums, different uh, chat rooms of IRC or GitHub, that is one way. So doing proactive threat intelligence and also doing threat hunting exercise where you are constantly looking out for threats. It could be sitting on your network. It could be you know people moving information out or it could be certain controls which are not configured correctly by the way application was designed. Uh, those are aspects which will play a very, very important role. And today, a lot of organizations are proactively doing cyber threat intelligence and hunting uh, 24 by 7 uh, and then fixing up the gaps rather than waiting for somebody to come and tell them that uh, they should uh, you know, fix a particular vulnerability which is left unpatched. This also creates a healthy environment because you don't have to then go for paying bounties to hacking groups who come and report. 
uh, or who ask you for money or brokerage to get your data down from a dark web forum or from a hacker okay great that that's uh, really important now just uh, taking that further uh, coming to ravindra uh, if we, if we currently look at the scenario uh, where criminals always uh, are kind of uh, ahead in using this technology like our artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learnings and uh, threat modeling and all those kind of stuff so taking the clue from where kanesh left uh, do you want to add uh, how as an organization we should look to you these kind of uh, techniques and try and prevent the criminals from misusing these techniques to uh, actually steal our data and probably our money or assets i mean like we say tit for tat we definitely okay all emerging technologies will always be some good hands and will always be in some bad hands okay there are definitely we know the difference between a hacker and a ethical hacker right the same right. problem the same war will continue always but we have to understand one thing that we cannot stop these you know criminals cyber criminals to use this latest technology it is available to all but we can use the same technology to strengthen our security framework let me tell you a quick example so most of the tool for example xdr we were talking about now all xdr edr are coming up with ai ml capability they actually yeah. see the trend what are the behavioral based changes the trend which is getting changed in the system and they immediately raise the alert and now we are we are having ai and ml based source solution which don't have to wait for administrator to come if they will find something suspicious based on our instruction based on our rule set they will remove that system from the network that it should not be infect other system so ai and ml capabilities are very strong there is no doubt so but i think in the same way the security companies are using them xdr source solution your dlp everyone is you know in build with ai and capability and the another important point for our today's topic application security most of the application security tool now coming up with are uh, having ai capabilities i i am mm-hmm. using one of the tool i don't want to enclose that which is having ai capability i am able to reduce 75% of false positive vulnerabilities because it has a ai built engine in that so okay. solution is very easy that we cannot stop this cyber criminals to stop using all these latest technologies but in the same way i think there are products available there are you know adoption innovation and digital transformation that we can actually choose and we can use these technology to strengthen and secure our uh, security framework great so so whatever tools criminals are using we also use the same tools but you we use it to protect and they are going to use it to break right so <laughs> that okay. that's very nicely that, uh, put that war will always continue that war will always continue that has to be <laughs> because there that are both to. sides of the two that's why I, I that's why see cso's job will be there right <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and <laughs> i personally believe that technology is developed by the human being so it's a human mind who use it to a good or who put it to a bad use so it's ultimately the right. people behind using that technology so till now we have discussed more on the technology part right from uh, uh, source uh, uh, strengthening to a monitoring and prevention by using say maybe ai ml kind of a techniques now how about looking at the people aspect in application fraud prevention because ultimately it's a human being who is trying to misuse these tools so any any views anybody wants to go first on that yeah ravinder so i would like to go because you know i think this domain i worked hard in you know last 10 12 years and you know the same problem you know i faced in my last organization currently but i think there is definitely a different road map you know implementing devsecops you know ci cd pipelines having a good uh, application security dynamic security static security tool is good the technology part is good but you know we actually know that you know uh, the weakest link is the human so application security program itself require a good awareness campaign for our software developer and you know there is a famous saying in application security that every developer knows how to build a software but very few developer knows how to build a secure software i think that culture change need to be drive from top down like i can give you right. some example in my current organization which i have taken in last you know one and a half year we actually created a program specifically for our developers there is a training okay. mandatory training it's like you know isms training is a mandatory training for every developer based on sense 25 or stop 10 vulnerabilities and they have to go through that 
after that after that training there is a program that we run as secure code warriors in that program we actually do a internal different type of exercises we actually open it for bug bounty hackers and everything to okay. make sure that our people are aware and definitely we identified security champion there are different quiz there are different mailers on different application security training i mean there are mailers on phishing and you know your uh, regular you know spear phishing and everything I'm but not. i think more important we have focused specifically on you know your sql injection cross site scripting cross site request forgery all this type of vulnerability where developer community should know when they are dealing day to day and the message is very clear from top down that our customer do not expect that application security is something separate it is more like a software design hygiene now if they want right. authentication should be enabled say they also want that sql injection should be disabled the vulnerability related to sql injection should be mitigated on that so this is more like a security hygiene whatever we want to deliver it will be a secure software so this is the way i think awareness really plays a critical role okay great uh, thanks thanks for those points ravinder uh, deepak uh, connect you want to add to that uh, people part of it so as rightly said by ravinder uh, even i echo the same thoughts and uh, since most of the organizations rather <clears throat> every organization go through their the regular vapt programs wherein it should not be a uh, instance where someone is coming and telling you that okay this is something which we found on your application Right. rather it should be starting from the scratch only when we are building a application that security thought process lot of regulations demanding for data privacy those regulations the controls behind it the thought process behind it ideas and methodology behind it need to be incorporated at the initial phase only so every developer when he is writing something he should be always with a mindset that i am not only writing a code but i am writing a secure code right. with a requirement and having also understanding and awareness on the latest trends on the application security part most of the organization still probably they are not even aware about that what are the owaps the things which has been getting released 2021 is getting released application api specific the security controls there is a separate owaps which has been released for api security as well so these are there are the multiple areas even ci cd security guidelines has been published so if there is a awareness on the what is required what is available what they can refer how they can the references can be incorporated into the existing the source code which they are developing and then possibly if there are the gartner reports or the charts if they refer probably if they are aware about the threats well ahead while they are building those will be taken care so that there will not be any chance for the outside vendor to identify and then remedy it so it will be rather than a, a, a reactive it will be a preventive mode so right. that approach should be adopted right right so so uh, essentially the change of mindset for the developers rather than just coding something that security coding should be uh, always uh, on the forefront of uh, the developers mind yes yes right and if yeah. the ready dashboards if they are available because not of the small small things which are coming up cicd it's now getting used everywhere now what are the issues which probably will come api specific security most of the time we just feel like okay it's just a connector it's not a connector right. even in the connector what are the issues which we need to look into so those things needs to be need to be taken care okay great uh, deepak connect you want to add anything on this part people related and uh, these areas so i think uh, because of covid and the resulted lockdowns a lot of organizations have moved to hybrid working models or switch to work from home now so today they are not behind corporate firewalls uh, right. and it's very difficult to safeguard them from different kind of phishing attacks uh, so the best way to protect the organization and its key employees is to train them help them navigate what kind of phishing attacks happen what is spear phishing what kind of malicious links uh they should not click uh how do you differentiate a mail which has come from a original source if they found out that somebody is asking them to make a payment uh verify by talking to that person that plays a very very important role 
Uh, also talk, talking about cybersecurity best practices, helping them understand what is social engineering, what is wishing, what kind of new scams are coming in. Today, we see a lot of scams which are related to crypto. Like today, everybody's trying to sell you an NFT uh, gig or a crypto on social media platforms or even following yeah. up to give you calls. And most of them are fraudulent, right? So a lot of time people use their organization's machines to click on these links and then get their systems compromised. And they don't even know their systems then get used for uh, compromising the other uh, people within the organization. So that's that's part of uh, the issue. And we saw this happening in case of Twitter. When Twitter's employees were compromised and hackers were able to get control of super admin accounts and control accounts of people like Bill Gates and Barack Obama and start sending links of crypto. So very important for organizations to train their employees regularly. Uh, also aspects on multi-factor authentication uh, needs to be told why people should follow multi-factor authentication because uh, a lot of times multi-factor authentication can safeguard from various kinds of risk where people are uh, you know, trying to get into systems from outside. Building up encryption plays a very, very important role uh, encryption can help safeguard uh, multiple layers which could be built in. So I think these aspects play an important role when it comes to cybersecurity. Okay. So so you want to suggest uh, something like try to use uh, certain tools also to try and compensate people weaknesses wherein there are ch chances that uh, because of today's scenario, the corporate life space and the personal life space, the line is actually blurred. And probably people are using their office laptop also to do cert certain personal tasks, something like checking the share pricing or checking the personal emails. And that's probably one of the challenge again, where as you suggested, form of the technology tools like a two-factor authentication or a multi-factor authentication or encryption of a corporate data or something like a mobile uh, management tool, MDMs, what we call it, that probably help try and compensate some people-related weaknesses. That's a, again a good approach to really look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And the other aspect which plays a very, very important role is for helping people understand new kinds of attack vectors. Uh, you know, just putting up a solution really doesn't help because there are always newer ways of compromise which keep on keep on coming in. Uh, so today uh, there are a lot of new scams coming out. So people will get random calls. Uh, on WhatsApp, their WhatsApp account will get taken over. People will ask for money. And then it all clicks back to your corporate identity as well. So today, your digital identity, you cannot say this is my personal digital identity. This is my official digital identity. It's all combined digital identity. So how do you safeguard your digital identity and your organization's uh, risk? Plays a, a very, very important role. Uh, we have seen that organizations have also started carrying out phishing exercises without letting the employees know and then decide what kind of trending people should be put into depending on whether they click a particular link or how they respond to a particular attack which is simulated so carrying out such activities play a very important role and also doing cyber war gaming simulations where you uh, create a scenario of a cyber attack and then see how people have responded to that uh, could, could be one way uh, we've seen how people leaving pen drives in offices Somebody picks up that pen drive, it's already infected, and then try and see how this goes forward, and then they identify who's the person, and then start the training. So building that proactive new models could, could play a very, very important role. Great. OK. Deepak, uh, you want to add anything? And then we probably can conclude, because we are just uh, on the block of hours. So. Yeah. See, likely Ravindra, Sachin, Kanish told that for people, security awareness training is the most important thing in software development also so for that we are already doing security awareness trainings uh, wherein we show live demos like hacking a mobile how sms is sent to your mobile and how we click the links on the mobile and how the hacker asks you for money so this type of training we also take uh, source code review trainings regularly every month we do it and after completing the training, we have a quiz program running, whereas to the user has to secure minimum 60% okay. in the quiz. And if he is below 60%, uh, awareness training is again given to him. So by this, we are uh, creating awareness in our employees, like what is phishing mails, 
how you have to avoid the phishing mails so this campaign we are running monthly yeah okay great uh, so i think we are just at the top of the hour so uh, i would just like to summarize what we discussed uh, till now so uh, looking at our topic application fraud prevention we actually discussed different types of application frauds then we talked about different technical uh, related controls right from uh, the control at the source to the control after implementation also what kind of uh, monitoring and prevention controls we can try to use then we also discussed about uh, the technologies like ai ml and deep learning and those areas and uh, as ravinder mentioned uh, we try to use the same tools to defend ourselves which the criminal are trying to use to break our uh, defense and uh, we also touched upon the very important aspect of people area because all the technology ultimately will be put to a real good use if the people behind that technology are really aware of how to securely use those uh, technologies so i think this sums up uh, a complete holistic approach of application fraud prevention and uh, thanks thanks uh, everybody for contributing and uh, i hope you all uh, have enjoyed the session so continue for the next session uh, in our global security summit and uh, thank you all hi everyone good afternoon i am kalish kaur founder of india futures foundation today i'll be moderating a panel with cyber security experts and chief innovation officers from india and the global market we'll be discussing on security in open banking a practitioner's approach uh i like to introduce our panelists mr prasanna lohar mr joe robertson dr lopa mudra basu mr chaitanya venkateshan and mr srinivas rao welcome everyone uh prasanna i would like to start with you we've seen that there is today heavy advocacy on use of web 3.0 technologies when it comes to banking and financial services but these technologies also have a element of risk with them let's look at blockchain which is spoken openly and try and understand how it is going to change the paradigm and how do you secure blockchain uh, in today's world we see that there are security in panel consultant when it comes to web 2.0 technologies but when it comes to web 3.0 there aren't any cyber security established firms or in panel consultants so how do we secure web 3.0 uh is the key question that we need to address today yeah i think a uh, uh, very very important aspect uh, 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 of security right you could see uh, the the way the adoption is happening for a uh, use cases and primarily millennials are bringing a lot of nfts decentralized finance kind of uh, use cases in front of the world and they will certainly will face or feel the the heat of a river or some kind of a, uh, some kind of a compliance issues and so on so very uh, very very important aspect uh, to have a better security rather as you rightly said there are no state forward standards the way we have a uh, uh, standards around web applications or standard on mobile application there are uh, top 10 odlc guidelines right so vulnerabilities which are mentioned which Uh, typically development whenever it happens we have a secure first approach for uh, developing those uh, against those uh, vulnerabilities right uh, so i think uh, this is a new field there are some companies are coming up uh, but they have they don't have that standard approach it, they have their own uh, orthodox approach which is not really certified somewhere so it's a huge market opportunity at the same time existing uh, uh, security firms are the way they are asking me are there any opportunities to work with these guys so that the experience which they have on or gain in the current ecosystem which is a web 2 can it be utilized in web 3 see it is evolving space condition it will take some time uh, we'll learn with the experience but uh, the speed is quite huge out here so and it's very very important say example uh, how do we see in a blockchain what happens it's a uh in that enterprise blockchain there is a phenomena or a term is called called uh, smart contracts right nodes or uh, there are some wallets uh, how do we secure your private key so there are common sense ways but there are standards around this so there are there is lot of work is happening on uh, standardization lot of papers are getting published for a dlt or blockchain or even metaverse or uh, any of those things but it's a huge market space where we need some kind of a standardization some kind of a 
framework which will help uh, uh, blockchain based or web 3.0 based uh, uh, things to be secure say example what happens in the banking whenever we work on any of those use case so we know how do we sign off at uh, it audit or uh, it security end right but there is an always a room where we have to keep it as a black box okay this is a smart contract this is a blockchain this is how it should work but nobody has really went ahead and done a security assessment of ethereum or uh, or hypermanager or uh, this platform which are primarily utilized uh, by uh, utilized by most of the community uh, developers and the companies for in how this community will work closely with the tech service provider security service provider at the same time how security service provider will get a uh, edge to be there as a helping hand for this uh, Coming, yeah. So we have to start with the basics of security. Okay. See, we will be securing uh, the uh, websites. We will be securing the the, the uh, data communication channels. We will be securing the the endpoints from where uh, the data emanates, and. We will be securing the the uh, uh, places wherever this data is moving. Okay, so there are various technologies which are being used. First is identification of the persons and the uh, the devices. So we use various technologies to identify this. Uh, one is the identity and access control management, and then there are uh, uh, network access control uh, solutions. Which help in identifying and controlling the devices. There will be uh, various uh, security solutions which are there for the endpoints, like encryption and uh, the anti-malware uh, solutions or antivirus solutions, which will give the basic uh, security. Okay. Then, then we will be having the uh, uh, DDoS prevention solutions, which will help. In in case of uh, the DNS cache poisoning or uh, the the malicious URLs, it it will check those things. Okay, so we should start with the basics, and the data should should get encrypted and the data should be stored encrypted. Uh, all all the security solutions which we are uh, using at present will get realigned. There will be some more security solutions which will evolve. To to address these zero trust requirements. Thank you. Web 3.0 is the new internet. See, Web 3.0 is the new version of the internet which is serverless and decentralized. An internet where users are in control of their own data, identity, and destiny. It uses decentralized protocols, crypto cryptographic methods to safeguard and benefit. And make the ecosystem stable and resilient. The three critical elements of Web 3.0 are decentralized web, blockchain, and linked data. So, this is not fully evolved or in the phase of evolution. There are many technological advances already afoot. So. we have to be very very cautious when using this uh, web 3.0 always from the security perspective stick to the fundamentals any technology if the user is using the technology always his security relies on his passwords or the authentications so choose solid passwords use multi factor authentication wherever practical use a password manager and again segment your networks log your network activity and review the logs periodically also be sure to examine internet ens domain this is not dns in the web 3.0 ens domain is coming into picture and cryptocurrency wallet addresses for cleverly hidden typos now we are seeing so many fake uh, urls uh, doing the social engineering and uh, uh, sending fake mails so by through which 
uh, some of the most of the customers are being cheated from the banking perspective likewise uh, you have valid addresses which are having cleverly hidden typos so these uh, we have to be very very cautious and uh, basic again never click on the links that are presented to you unsolicited via social media or email again the phishing then most important thing in the web 3.0 is seed phrase like our password retrieval this seed phrase is very very important in this blockchain technology when you want to recover your data this seed phrase can be in the form of qr code also so whenever you want to recover your data seed phrase is very very important and seed phrase should not be shared ever with anyone ever with anyone so the seed phrase if you lose the seed phrase then completely all your digital belongings are lost then if possible try to think about using a hardware wallet so any good defender will tell you that the most robust security system utilizes many different layers of security using a hardware wallet adds another layer of security to your cryptocurrency or nft holdings since you must plug in the device enter a pin and approve or reject your transactions yes sir excellent points here uh, jo you want to share your views on the secure web 3.0 Yes, uh, certainly and uh, it's obviously uh, an area that is of great interest to the financial uh, community uh because of the various different ways that uh, it can be used the blockchain and just the generically web 3.0 the security of those functions is going to have to be dealt with uh in ways similar to what we do now with uh with the firewalling and and things like that and and also authentication one thing i can tell you though is this has certainly attracted the attention of the bad guys out there the bad actors out there uh the 40 guard labs which is the research and de- development arm of of Fortinet uh with the company that I work for uh they track uh, billions of events around the internet every day uh, around the world and one of the things that the trends that they have seen in the last 6 to 8 months that has really taken off is attacks on cryptocurrency cryptocurrency wallets especially because just like the uh, thieves try to rob a bank because that's where the money is well the cryptocurrency wallets are where the money is and so they are under attack right now so see this is going to be a very important security subject in coming years thanks thanks yo uh dr basu uh, would want to get your views how do we secure some of the emerging technologies when it comes to web 2.0 technologies when we look at any emerging technology the biggest challenge is unknown risks associated with because technology itself is not fully proof there is a risk component associated and majority of the time the risk technology risk assessment when it is coming to the kind of emerging ecosystem we are looking at the fintech or maybe you know small companies actually getting inside the ecosystem the major question is do they have a proper technology risk management practice and tool in place followed by implementing that and capturing those risks supported by proper set of technology risk management professional secondly when it is coming to the security risks or cyber risk specifically nowadays we can see lots of sophisticated attacks right so what is the kind of you know quality to protect those information sensitive information within this technology is there a way that why this technology is within your ecosystem what kind of data manipulation is possible that tracks needs to be assessed and in case you have a system dependency 
and what would be the scenario what would be the uh, you know uh, way to retrieve the data or make the data available which are within those uh, emerging technology supported by emerging technology or hosted by emerging technology if they are unavailable and how we will maintain the data confidentiality constantly because this is a very very complex ecosystem and multiple partner it is not only the third party partner it is multiple partner connected within that ecosystem these are the major risks and what kind of grip each of the partner having on over those technology what they are using let's move ahead we see yeah. that financial privacy and security of consumer financial data are the main concerns for anyone involved in the open banking environment uh, jo i want to get your views first what are your thoughts around security in open banking environment <coughs> Well the the very first thing I'd say is the very term open banking it strikes fear into the hearts of security professionals uh and that's not a phrase that we like to hear but uh, seriously open banking really means that as the cybersecurity professionals we need to make sure that our institutions are implementing best practices okay that means whether you're talking about uh data and information that's in a public cloud or in your own data center and most importantly it it's really important to have a security first mindset throughout the organization not just in the security and the IT teams now this means that your devops need to become dev secops uh, it means that the development teams include the security teams from the beginning of each project rather than what we see far too often is they develop something and they throw a new app over to the security folks and say go test this we've got to we got to go live in one week okay that is uh, something that you want to definitely weed out of your organization security built in from the beginning uh in developing new applications for consumers and for interactions between your financial institutions thanks so uh Prasanna, your views on securing open banking? I think uh, very, very important because uh, uh, what happens, you know, if it is a physical branch, we know how to secure a physical branch, right? There is a security guard, and there are a lot of rules uh, of PCIDSS. How do we handle that data? If it is an operation center where your cards are getting personalized, there are rules, right? So when it comes to open banking, you are actually opening your complete bank, right? So through form of a one API or a two APIs, and these days, example. Uh, one fintech talking to a bank right it is not only payment but they are now talking about uh, uh, building new banks right which comprise of set of apis based upon a business model say example buy now pay later so it will have uh, all those apis which are relevant to lending or a fixed deposit all the apis relevant to account opening uh, or ddu or aml kyc right so what is it mean it means that while you are opening your doors we need to understand what is it you are opening so that's what i where we need a security at a multiple levels so like how are you really opening up apis apart from that what kind of a how you are covering your data risk or uh, uh, the risk which is like uh, say example the fintech may be outside of india inside of india on which cloud what is his agreement with that uh, company or how do we safeguard so apart from technolo technological risk assessment and the security we need to see this other angle also if a data goes wrong or data theft is happening at the partner end so ultimately it had it comes out to the bank because bank is a ultimate uh, owner of a customer's data right so very very important aspect so banks these days what they are doing uh, it's not only uh, 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 physical assessment or uh, agreements apart from that uh, uh, apis all the apis are following the detailed standards right so whenever as a bank we are also opening up it's a detailed standard how do we really tokenize it uh, uh, securing with uh, some keys which you have to provide to the partner and do it uh, thoroughly vaps right before actual get into the production environment in a uat pre prod then actually open it and while opening it also there are separate different zones zones for uh, 
uh, uh, for fintechs uh, compared to the what we have different other channels like internet or mobile banking. So very important aspect, uh, uh, Kanish. Uh, and while I could say that this Web three world, right, which is completely on a open banking model or a marketplace kind of a model, right. So banks will open up their APIs. And all banks' data will be available out there for customer to choose which which is the best bank, right? So that's these are the future models. So, and while we are opening up our APIs on web applications tomorrow, it will be on uh, machines, right? So your API is being consumed by variables. So more additional uh, uh, security uh, uh, constraints are on IoT plus. I think we'll have to really figure it out. Are there any platforms? Are there any frameworks which will take care of a uh, uh, open banking along with the web or mobile or uh, IoT interfaces also in the future. So it's a uh, uh, banks have achieved at least so far for web-based interfaces. We need to really see how more uh, better approach. So what banks are doing now, apart from their monolithic architecture, right? They are now looking at how they can have conversion of this uh, serverless or uh, microservices kind of architecture which is a more better secure than monolithic architecture. So I think while we are moving ahead from yesterday's client server-based architecture to web services, now it is getting into monolithic, microservices, serverless. So it's a, it's a journey, right? So in this journey, I think security plays a very, very important aspect here. Yeah. Dr. Basu, would want I think the points are already well captured by Joe and Prasanya. The few points I would like to highlight is we need to move from risk acceptance culture to risk mitigation culture. You may have a good PAPT capability, you may have a adoption of deficit cops, but how much we are applying those concepts to mitigate the risks rather than accepting the risks, obviously they are Shadow IT is another thing, which is a huge challenge. And some of the organization, it's really difficult to, you know, remove those shadows. Rather than removing those shadows, this is the time to look at what kind of shadows do you have. Shadows means, you know, left and right adopted some of the technologies, some of the service provider, among which what are the best discover your shadow govern them from security perspective, look at that, uh, you know, who are the service provider, technology provider, bring them under shadow IT governance. And when it is coming to the API, right, as we all know that open banking is the future of banking, we need to build a proper ecosystem to protect the APIs. It is more than just putting an effective control. Rather than we need to focus, followed by uh, you know, uh, devising proper control, build a capability to continuously monitoring them, and how to retrieve from a kind of situation where we can see there is a attack or there is a compromise, how we can retrieve them quickly, or if we need to stop them quickly, how to do that. And also one of the area is access control, adoption of Microsoft services or uh, serverless technologies require a major focus on access control. And when we are looking at the access control, what uh, we, uh, we need to also look at that the culture, right? Uh, among a particular uh, geography, what kind of privacy awareness, security awareness among your end user? Because when we are going to provide the accesses, it will obviously going to give a trusted access, but what kind of culture they have related to password or what kind of uh, actual sensitivity there. Building that ecosystem is, is a major challenge apart from technology because getting a best technology is not that much challenge, but creating that entire ecosystem 
secure ecosystem for open banking is a major challenge for the organization today thank you uh, thank you dr basu so uh, moving ahead you seen that the banks and fintechs are doing certain things so that there are no gaps when it comes to opening new kind of bank accounts uh, but there are still multiple challenges which come into the system because the banks also have a large ecosystem partners that have to be taken into account and not everything is being done directly by themselves so how do you secure the entire supply chain is the key question prasanna so my question uh, prasanna is that how do we secure the banking and supply banking supply chain ecosystem how do you work with the partners how do you secure so that there is no gap when it comes to customer fulfillment i think it's very uh, easy right and banks are doing this traditionally since uh, so many years together right banks have detailed process around how do we evaluate them partner based upon various parameters right so the company's uh, nitty gritty is who is the founder apart from this uh, non traditional uh, parameters technical things right whether it fits into our architecture what type of experience they have built in similar kind of applications for uh, other uh, banks or other uh, organizations right so let us say example let's say example video kyc right so if i are to onboard a partner on a video kyc i need to really see what type of integrations they have whether the, the platform is uh, on prem or uh, on cloud uh, most of the time say example 2022 2020 when this video kyc came into banks life most of the platforms were on cloud so it was a very uh, tedious job for us to get into uh, how do we really evaluate a cloud based uh, platforms right so so it there comes so we had created our own checklist considering security and uh, evaluation of the partners how easy are those apis for consumption how secure are those apis for consumption moreover how data is being uh, secured at a uh, partner side on, on those uh, their uh, cloud platforms right so we had evaluated further more uh, physically by going there what all process they to follow in their development so we typically whenever we onboard a customer onboard any partner based upon a technical evaluation then how do we create that continuity of a uh, inspection of those partners right say example sms banking or uh, your card management system we never know what happens in their premise right so physical every time we uh, uh, quarterly we visit them inspect the environment there are various parameters there are certifications we ask them vaps or pcids pads based on type of implementation or deployment so apart from selective partners makes sense that keep a eye on a partner so rbi gives lot of guidelines which helps to really work closely with the partners so moreover if uh, some of the partners are handling your data right so are they taking care of a uh, relevant guidelines of uh, doing disaster recovery drills uh, securing the platforms uh, securing them on a quarterly basis or a regularly basis for uh, vaps providing those required certifications which rbi keeps on asking us right whether the code is malicious or not right so this kind of a uh, uh, assessment also are also very very important third thing like if a partner is sitting at your end right at your office so do you have a separate partner zone right or a network zone for your partner to access the systems apart from physical security how logical boundaries are also kept intact for a partner right what we see uh, some of the fraud is happening some of the banks because of partners right so they are having access for some some applications or some system right so so selection criteria apart from selection criteria verification and assessment criteria is also very important panish uh, uh, now going further for open banking say or uh, uh, blockchain or any of those so same assessment continues moreover what it will bring on more additional challenges at how secure are their platforms right and if they are if we are deploying their platforms at our end are they doing any uh, mischievous activities are they creating any malware after deployment or even if their source code or their deployment is coming into our uh environment so scanning them pro- appropriately and taking a, a sign off from it security then only deploy is very very important right so it is a very systematic process every bank is following and it is well supported by compliance guidelines or regulatory guidelines given by uh, indian regulators yeah and there are a lot of certificates also which keeps uh, giving support like pcds uh, iso uh, certificate isms certifications for uh, systems or partners 
VEPTs for their ecosystems. Yeah. See, security in open banking is very important because uh, generally we call it a supply chain. Okay. There are various service providers who are there who will be doing the processing, who will be doing the, the data collection, who will, be, uh, uh, who will be giving various inputs, and uh, the, there will be various services which are being availed. Like, uh, uh, let us say, in case of banks, uh, we will be taking the services of the credit underwriters, we will be taking the services of the uh, credit information companies, uh, uh, we will be taking the services of the payment gateway. So everything gets important. So the, the communication between these, these entities are to be more secure and they, they should be properly authorized. So uh, it, it, first is the customer data is to be protected. So for this, we'll be using uh, various technologies like uh, redaction, uh, encryption of data, masking of data, so that only the required data is known to the required people and others are not able to, to see that data. Okay. Then, then we'll, we'll also be uh, authenticating the connections between the service providers and the bank servers. Okay. So there, there, there will be controls to ensure that uh, there, uh, there, uh, no, no unauthorized persons are able to get connected or, uh, or they are able to manipulate the data. So uh, things are very important. So there are, there are various uh, standards which are evolving. Uh, we call it as uh, the PCI DSS standards and the cyber security framework which are there. And RBI has also come out with uh, the uh, digital payment system security controls uh, for the mobile systems. So these things will be put in place and some more uh, uh, there will be security uh, concepts evolving to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. So as very appropriately told by Venkitation, the key thing is scoping that data which is going to be accessed by the service provider. What is the sensitivity of the data? And what kind of technology control we are expecting? To see that, you know, when technology control, it is not that, you know, uh, maybe expectation is these are the technology in the place rather than because they are maybe, you know, uh, using the cloud environment. Majority of the cases you will get the cloud environment. So when it is coming to the in-house control, what is the technology control we are a bank is using earlier when it is in-house or scenario when the service provider not using in uh, cloud in-house control, what is the control objective? See that control objective is achieved in the cloud environment because cloud controls are different. That is one of the area. And secondly, when it is coming to, uh, you know, building a, uh, a ecosystem to investigate some of the breaches or any incident, is that properly in place? Is that technological control as well as the, uh, uh, you know, a contractual agreement in place that allow you to have that kind of connect with your service provider that you know you will be able to get the transparency because most of the cases that's, that is very important that uh, you have those rights to exercise. That is one of the part, apart from that, whatever discussed currently, I would like to highlight because you may have everything is in place, but you may not have a proper contractual agreement which allow you to investigate further or access further. Thank you, Dr. Basu. Joe, your views? Well, securing the supply chain, yeah. 
Sure. When we're talking about the the open banking system, of course, there's lots of potential gaps uh, because there are so many partners that are involved. And those gaps are obviously where attackers are going to be trying to slip in. So in open banking, you not only need to cover your own environment, you also need to make sure that if one of your partners or counterparties uh, hasn't really protected his environment, that they aren't spreading their contamination, if you will, into your system. So, uh, in fact, that's why uh, I saw a study recently that IDC did that showed that in Europe, 55% of financial institutions have already implemented what's called a zero trust architecture. It's also known as least privilege. And what that does is it identifies all users. And that a user can be a, an individual, obviously, but it can also be applications. It can even be the API calls from partner banks. And those users are only granted access to certain applications. So unlike uh, unlike an old VPN system where you get access to an entire network, here the access is only to specific applications. So even if the partner is contaminated, uh, as I said, they may be able to uh, get into that one application, but they can't spread around into the rest of your environment. Uh, a second point that I would like to make, too, uh, is that fintechs and banks are leveraging automation platforms to do all of this stuff. And they're, they're often deploying their infrastructure using infrastructure as code, uh, as a model. And that lets them change their infrastructure really quickly and very easily. But it also can expose them to unintended vulnerabilities. Uh, so I think that they should also be taking security as a code as their approach, in addition to as part of the infrastructure as a code. So building security into, as I mentioned before, before the, the structure of DevOps op applications. And that can mean, for example, uh, calling up an internal segmentation firewall that can leverage in, intent-based segmentation. Uh, it can also apply adaptive process controls, and provide automated threat protection across that entire infrastructure as code environment. And that's all with the, the objective of <clears throat> reducing the size of those gaps so that through. Thank you, uh, Robert. So, uh, so moving forward, what are some of the tools and solutions that we could potentially look at for securing the open banking system? Are there a set of commercial tools? Are there a set of open source tools? Can there be COTS applications? Uh, who are the sort of vendors we should look into? Uh, I'll start with you, Prasanna. Uh, there are no specific solutions available for uh, safeguarding open banking out there, right? It's a, it's a similar, you need to leverage on the existing uh, methodologies, right? Existing uh, frameworks, right? To really take care of uh, uh, open banking integrations primarily between two parties. So one way to could, uh, could be like the way, how are you opening the APIs, right? Is it a point to point or a public APIs, right? Uh, uh, so typically what we follow at a bank end is our point to point APIs. We provide a IP based uh, access uh, to the partners rather than it's a public API, which is available for everybody to browse it right so it shouldn't be that way other way to look at how and where your uh, data power or would say the external apis are deployed yeah, and how these external apis are consuming the internal apis so there is a segregation of a network out there right so in a mean to say that kanish there are there are no straightforward platforms which will say deploy it and you you will be secure for open banking you need to really take care of many more aspects the way I answered in the last question. So apart from integrating in a secure way, uh, APIs at uh, both the ends, the next thing, how do we really see the uptimes, downtimes, how every call is coming up, is it uh, coming up the way we have agreed as a standard SOP or a standard format? Uh, typically, we provide some key secure keys or tokenize those APIs so that we know the... Uh, request is coming from authentic source secondly there are there there could be a way uh, say example in the blockchain we can have a, 
uh, two nodes, right? For example, these nodes are can be shared between the uh, the partner and the the bank, and at the both the end data should be the same, right? So, example, so the data of every request which is being sent at a partner end should be again rechecked at a, with the help of a hashing mechanism at a bank end. If the request is a and if a, if it is really matching, then only allow that request to get into the next layer, right? That is a one way we are looking at how do we really safeguard uh, API calls. It's as such, there is no platform available, but this is how we devise this mechanism, right? We can we not utilize this technology, which gives a mechanism that data cannot be tampered. Uh, what does it mean if a partner is tampering data or in between data is getting tampered over the air? Will not allow that request to come in because we know what partner has really sent as a as an agreement, right? So. In a nutshell, there could be one or two platforms which will directly say, "I will safeguard your open banking." Because while we open APIs through available platforms, like there are platforms like Tipco, IBMs, and uh, WSO2 or um, uh, APG gateways by Google, so they have their own security guidelines which they follow and which they claim that these are there. But when it comes to an actual implementation between two partners, these are the two different systems, right? So. So we need to leverage on many aspects. It's not only one platform which will safeguard the next year. Joe, do you want to go in next? Sure. I think that uh, Prasanna has uh, said uh, very well uh, some of the points. I think the big thing is that there's there is as he said there's no one solution, and it's actually going to involve using a variety of different devices, different applications, different tools, each of which is really designed to protect. Uh, a different aspect of the the attack sequence that uh, that the bad guys uh, are going through, uh, and all of these different tools. However, they really nowadays they need to be able to talk together through standards, through APIs, uh, and really what Gartner has called. Uh, a cybersecurity mesh architecture so that the devices from different vendors can work together as a unified whole. Now in in banking, for example, uh, the, the banking APIs that we're talking about, they're cloud-based. Um, even when they're in your own data center, they're still cloud-based. So you need to put in place cloud workload protections. And there are tools that are available, including next-generation firewalls, such as uh, what comes from my company, 40, Fortinet. Uh, they can be spun up and torn down in virtual machines and containers. Um, also, there are protection tools that can monitor all of the workloads, the different workloads, and they can detect unusual behavior, such as uh, exfiltration of data. Uh, and of course, uh, they also help you uh, putting in place uh, good hygiene. They can uh, give you indications of, of when an application is compromised. Uh, also, you should be doing things like encrypting all personal data, obviously, that's standard hygiene, locking down the databases um, and, and ensuring, uh, as I've kind of mentioned before in DevSecOps, ensuring that your developers are familiar with security tools, the security tools that are available to them. Um, you know, in most clouds, databases, at least public clouds, databases are by default exposed externally unless you explicitly lock them down. Uh, that's the kind of thing you want to make sure that uh, your developers are, are aware of and working on. Uh, and then, of course, finally, and I, I think that Dr. Basu was talking about this somewhat, and I mentioned it uh, already, you want to positively identify all users, okay? whether people or applications or, or partners, or API calls, and you grant them that specific access to specific applications in a zero trust type of architecture. And that zero trust architecture is not just for data centers or not just for uh, remote access. It actually functions very effectively in clouds uh, and anywhere else. So those are a lot of the things that we can do to protect ourselves. The big point is they need to be viewed and managed and able to be managed as an integrated whole so that they can be giving you real-time information on, on what your threat situation is at any moment. Thank you, Joe. Dr. Basu? So when it is coming to this securing the entire ecosystem, there is no single solution as mentioned by Joe as, is, uh, as well as Preston now. What? But 
hygiene and the best practices are very important. Hygiene is the key factor here because if we go back and start looking at the OWASP API security vulnerabilities, it's actually talking about the old vulnerabilities like you know bro broken authentication, ex extensive data exposure, then uh, broken function level authentication, injection related issues, security misconfiguration, must assignment. So we need to really, really look at the kind of practice within, uh, the, within the organization. We need to cut the risks at root or control the risks at root by ensuring that all the developer not only trend on secure development practice, they should be able to visualize the risks and the devastating impact associated with that if they are not actually implementing those practice. Also, one of the area is very important when it is coming to the banking, open banking uh, in, uh, environment, capability for attack surface monitoring. So when it is not uh, open banking, you have a very nice uh, perception about the attack surface monitoring means whatever outside of my territory, I'll monitor that. But today that concept is not working. We need to focus on the external surface partner surface as well as our internal yes. surface. While doing so, we need to also build the capability to funneling those because you get an extensive number of logs. You get an extensive number of alert. And most of the cases, if you look at uh, in the past experience of industry, somewhere the alert is there and people are missing it because of extensive load of alert. So how you are going to screen and get those that is one of the most important area and capability to act on that while it is coming to the bank banking ecosystem because you know uh, it is not you or your few partner right it's a collaboration within that ecosystem to stop that attack so that is one of the area i think everybody needs to work to focus on that area Thank you, Dr. Basu, for the inputs. Uh, with this, we've come towards the end of the session. Any closing remarks uh, from Prasanna, Dr. Basu, Joe? From my side, is you know, uh, security is a layer defense approach. That is something we need to continuously build on, and. Zero trust, it's a concept, how we are best utilized, that concept above all, how we can build a collaborative environment to deal with continuously emerging sophisticated threat, not only with the adoption of good practices or having the best technology in place going to work. Collaboration is the key to sustaining this environment. Yeah, I think I uh, I think very well said. Security is a continuous journey, right? And we keep we have to keep innovating the various ways. We have to follow the best practices to the time, right? So as well as uh, we have to keep eye on what regulation is talking about. Uh, regulation coming with a lot of new guidelines. We have to address them on time. Keep reviewing your boundaries, uh, logical, physical, right? The way Dr. Lopa has uh, addressed, like uh, at a, at a various surface level, we need to really look at. And certainly there are some partners who you, who you have to keep on listening, hearing, doing some practice with POCs and uh, allow them to come in and uh, uh, do the better job, right? So I think partner alignment is also important because they are also doing a lot of research on this and they can be uh, another accelerating factors in your uh, journey. I think security is uh, what we have seen security in 2000 and today and maybe tomorrow after we'll have a different set of uh, customer interfaces, right? Apart from mobile and web, it could be something else. So that is how it will keep on evolving. Uh, we also have to evolve and adopt uh, the best of the best. 
And I suppose I would just summarize uh, the, the open banking environment, the security aspects of it, that you want to make sure that you're thinking strategically and not just tactically. And so you want to have an integrated security strategy that's going to include zero trust, cloud workload protection, next generation firewalls, hardware and, and virtual, whether they're public or private clouds, uh, infrastructure as code, and uh, I guess finally, a good threat intelligence service that keeps your tools up to the minute on threats, on indications of compromise, and, and on attack vectors. And we, we try to protect ourselves as best possible uh, in a very changing threat landscape. Thank you, uh, everyone. But this will come towards the end of the session. Uh, many thanks to my fellow panelists for joining this session. Hello, I'm Kalpana Singhal, founder and CEO CXO TV from Tech Plus Media Group. Welcome to this interesting fireside chat on endpoint security, which is security from home to the enterprise. As employees are still working from anywhere in a hybrid work arrangement, endpoints continue to multiply and connect from anywhere. Security teams are required to scramble and protect both managed and now more unmanaged devices than ever. This fireside chat will discuss the trends of attack, new hardware and software security solutions, and how to build a strong defense on the device in the enterprise and the cloud to protect the endpoints. Please welcome Mohit Gupta Group, Chief Information Security Officer, Matasan Group, to help us explore how enterprise controls, cloud controls, and the home office controls come together to secure the remote user experience. A very warm welcome to you, Mohit. Thank you, Kalpna. Well, in the context of today's topic, like COVID-19 has caused the relocation of employees from office to home, just expanding the attack surface. Mohit, how do you see the threat landscape expanding for organizations with distributed workforce? Well, certainly uh, the threat landscape has changed a lot. Uh, in these past couple of years, in many ways, first we need to acknowledge that this pandemic-related disruption is different from the traditional business disruptions that we all had been witnessing for past so many years. So in scale, uh, when traditional disruptions or say business impact was too localized, limited to a specific firm, to its location, probably to a geography, to a specific supplier or to a say third party. But have we ever thought that everyone would going to get impacted? This so-called uh, pandemic related disruption had impacted all geographies, all suppliers, all locations, all of your vendors, all of your customers, and almost everyone in the world. So irrespective of how much diversified you were, irrespective of how many geography, geographies were you present in, irrespective of where all your customers were present, all were Im impacted. Talking about domain, but traditionally, uh, business impacts was limited to, say, a few hours, uh, to a possibly in certain uh, scenarios, possibly to a week maximum. Yeah. With this pandemic, we had witnessed a year-long impact which is where we witness wave two, wave three, and so on and so forth. And we still don't know if at all we will we'll witness a new wave, isn't it? And then there are obviously uh, workforce shortages, capacity limitations, velocity of impact across business functions and many similar things. In security field, as we, as we talk about zero day attacks, this COVID-19 attack, I always say that this is a perfect example of a zero day attack in reality. Wherein uh, again, there there was no cure available uh, when it hit us. So fundamentally, at this outbreak, most organizations had pre-established BCPs, their contingency plans to obviously ensure their operational continuity. But such plans obviously did not cover all that that I I, I just talked about, which was all uncontrolled and evolving variables, uh, right from supply chains to widespread lockdowns to capacity issues and so on and so forth. So I, I personally believe that the uh, word has changed and will change even further. Yeah, absolutely. While the attacks of it was already difficult to manage and the move to remote work during the pandemic changed again, uh, literally overnight. 
So offering security to endpoints distributed across the locations has been a major challenge for organizations. And what is your strategy to secure systems in a distributed network? See, we all had some or other layer of security for endpoints. And since we are only talking about endpoints, but it, it certainly the, this threat landscape has changed with newer dynamics covering not only the endpoints, but all all sort of endpoint devices will include servers, laptops, mobile devices, your OT systems, your IOTs, like in our scenario, there are sensors on the fleet. So effectively, IT is on the road, uh, on the move. So effectively, um, uh, this whole threat landscape has changed. And we all, obviously all had to adjust our strategy and to an extent adopt newer solutions, uh, so-called new next-gen solutions or new generation solutions to secure this new distributed uh, uh, system ecosystem. So in principle, we always focus on endpoints of all types, but at the same point of time, user identity as well, which is very, very important because that is where uh, the complexity even multiply is multifold. The complexity of uh, with endpoint is, is different, especially when we, we, we could talk about uh, uh, personal devices or varied security questions. In pandemic time, nearly all enterprises, if not 100%, if not 50%, at least to some degree of percentage allowed BYOD, their personal devices to be used. And they all had different security posture. What do we do to adjust our security posture for all these personal devices, which itself was having a having its own security posture? We didn't know whether the, the personal device was updated with the security configurations that we expect. We didn't know whether the uh, antivirus was being deployed on those endpoints and those personal devices which were being used by our employees. So we went for a refreshed risk assessment covering all endpoint types, all identity types, irrespective whether it is a local user, a local admin, or a privileged account. But then um, to be able to address all, all of it, we obviously had to pick some of the solutions. Since I talked about NetGen, so it could be in the form of EDR, MFA, PAM, advancement in SOC to be able to gain the speed, especially around those sore use cases. So we again went ahead and refreshed our overall incident response plan to even cover more aggressive response mechanisms, the special focus around this uh, privilege, support, and end users as well. Yeah. So uh, what are the solutions and uh, from which all, uh, you know, uh, I would say what who are the, your technology partners for these enterprise mobility solutions, uh, you know, definitely for for uh, using these BYODs? So, again, there are there are a variety of OEMs that we involve in a conglomerate like us. Uh, it would be too hard for me to define which particular OEM, but we nearly use all, all OEMs and nearly all technologies which are uh, nearly essential for uh, endpoint security. So uh, do you also have uh, some of your own technologies? Yes, very much. We have nearly about 20 odd uh, different custom applications which are there, uh, which we internally, not, which are not only used for our business applications, but otherwise also for our security needs. Because irrespective of what we do, especially when it comes to integration, there are a lot of middlewares that we have to create to be able to have this, uh, to be able to gain the speed of how do we respond to adverse situations. Yeah, yeah. So offering security to uh, uh, endpoints distributed across the locations has been a major challenge that we have discussed. So how do you enable a balance between uh, adequate security and access and employee experience? Um, I'm reminded of one of the statistics that highlighted that uh, uh, about 36% of employees find ways to bypass organization security policies. And uh, this was very interesting to me. But important to understand is that why do they do it at first place? Why do they bypass organization security policies? Well, uh, if you we, if we go into the root, the problem is when employees are using their devices and that too, when they bypass these security controls, they do it in a very risky ways. I guess that they, they do it to find convenience, which is more important to them then the security controls which are adopted by organization. So uh, a beat when, when they do online surfing, be it when they 
uh, use one application over another be it when when they want to um, probably uh, install some application bypassing again uh, some of the controls that we may have so important is that uh, we need to respect and we need to pass on this respect back to the end user to again understand uh, why are they actually doing it and uh, again important is that uh, mm, not only we adopt the technology but we evaluate the technology in such a way which strike the right balance between convenience and security controls that we want to adopt so uh, for endpoints we all uh, talk about edr and solutions like xdr and so and so forth uh, but not going into too much of details how this to be implemented how to choose our right technology we need to yes fairly understand that uh, user convenience should be one of the criteria in uh, in the way we evaluate technology but again but again in the context of how what you asked uh, i would like to talk about two important uh, foundations uh, foundation areas as well first is we must respect the the need of employee convenience for sure end user convenience should be one of the criteria that we not only uh, as i said in corporate and the way we evaluate technology but in an ongoing manner how are we monitoring our security control implementation there is certainly nothing wrong in in passing on that respect back to the end user why don't we go back uh, and do a quick review of all those recent privilege requests that our end user have asked or our user class in general have asked and we rejected in the name of security can we not identify alternate ways how security can be implemented which doesn't bother end user which maintain yeah, okay. yeah which maintain the rights right balance but equally important i guess that the second foundation that i i, I must highlight is protect the uh, employee identity also when when you strike this balance in user convenience over uh, security like for instance a lot of people deploy controls like 2fa uh, at times mfa so picking up technology is one aspect of it but how effectively and efficiently and smartly are we implementing that technology is very very important can we not create those rules which ensures that if at all my user is already logged in uh, say in the morning using uh, mfa and they are operating in the same environment using the same device and there is no abnormality in its behavior so can we not integrate sso controls into it can we not have technology uh, evaluate and detect any abnormality in the in the authorized user behavior also so again as everyone highlights security by design so security during evaluation also becomes important Thank yeah you. of course so the last few years have seen the highest number of security incidents and data breaches in spite of stringent regulations and increased security capabilities so in such a scenario do you think there is a pressing need to update our incident response approaches what should be the updates in the incident response approach for organization to make itself resilient uh, enough to identify prevent and recover from any disruptions that may arise from new threat vectors and attack techniques so uh, very interesting point again um, see data security and privacy uh, regulations are evolving are evolving across the world in many geographies alone in mothers there are about 100 odd uh, regulations which and contractual obligations which makes our compliance framework very very complex and there has been a need in timely um, reporting these to regulators also like for instance in india i'm unsure how many people do understand that it act also demand us to report any of the security Um, uh, security incident in a in a timely manner uh, again the time frame if i recall it right as per notification again is uh, around 72 hours similar is in in gdpr now us also has come up with a draft law which is to enact i'm unsure whether it is already enacted no but past couple of days there has been a lot of buzz around so uh, uh, these timelines are coming up in in every geography almost in every country uh, uh, almost to report again to 
regulators and if at all we are to meet those timelines do we not need uh, enough uh, strict and speedy mechanisms response mechanisms through which uh, we first involve re- relevant stakeholders within do draft our response mechanisms to regulators in a in a draft mode first deliberate that involve relevant stakeholders including your uh, insurance bodies in sh- uh, including your business stakeholders in, in certain circumstances your user class also and your customer and supplier class also if at all they are also a equal stakeholder in that particular instance and then report back to uh, the regulators so i guess this uh, the speed is of essence and you rightly use the word resilience that can only be done when when we make sure that we we incorporate all these aspects into the plan itself so we need to plan very very deeply very very effectively if at all we don't know we should involve experts around and make sure that we incorporate each of such element and uh, uh, prepare ourselves for the worst so do you think emerging technologies can act as an enabler to cyber security or are they just an added area for concern for the cisos and how can organizations utilize such technologies to strengthen their cyber security posture and gain a competitive advantage well no one would deny that uh, these emerging technologies are certainly important see the ultimate objective is to to lay down a strong foundation to build not only a scalable but agile cyber security landscape uh, which has a ability to seamlessly uh, adapt and respond to any of the sophisticated cyber attack that happens in any of the environment and obviously to adjust with newer threat landscape but let me focus on um, uh, on the core principles rather than getting into technologies uh, because technologies could be many and then uh, each enterprise has its own business needs has its own uh, tolerance level has its own security uh, posture as is and the desire to be so uh, but these core principles always remain same like for instance i always focus on four core principles but the the very first is security by default uh, which is uh, which is a cultural change to incorporate security in the solution planning itself as i said in the, in the previously also that we need to incorporate security at the time of evaluation whatever we we choose at the planning stage itself uh, we need to involve uh, we need to we need to think security we need to incorporate those security controls in the design stage itself rather than thinking it after implementation or during implementation because then then your, your whole architecture would be into change so uh, that becomes very very important security by default then i guess the second core principle is defense in depth yes uh, an attempt to go as deep as it is possible in the design itself as we may possibly to deploy uh, necessary uh, security controls nearer to the workloads and embrace uh, the latest technology again the emerging technology for more efficient operation speed of of essence make sure that your security control should not become deterrent in the way we respond to any of the attack so while we embrace defense in depth but we need to also see that the the speed should not uh, be uh, hindered because of these core principles the third principle uh, i always admire is the solution and any of the technology that we that we adapt should be scalable and agile an articulation in the way the solutions are evaluated are implemented are institutionalized Uh, not only in the way we 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 implement it but we provide support uh, support that uh, takes care of uh, uh, today's needs as well as future need of business and agile enough that if at all tomorrow your business need changes you should be able to adjust those uh, technology architectures to an extent that it it addresses your uh, growth needs your change needs the current technology if at all it doesn't support the growth would we be able to scale it up the answer is no would we be able to have the agility in the way we design those security uh, policies for different organizations because they have different needs answer it would be no so again uh, cloud versus on prem decisions build versus buy decisions uh, are to be very much incorporated when we talk about core principles of scalability and agility 
not only how it uh, is to be adopted for today's need but also for future needs and last uh, uh, important core principle is resilient by design again not just to focus upon how to get back uh, to business after something goes wrong but important is how do we position the business to elevate the brand equity if something goes wrong and gain again and sustain the uh, stakeholders confidence i guess uh, that is where uh, the the answer towards cyber is resi- uh, resiliency lies and it is important that we stay focused in picking up these core principles when we choose any of the emerging technology yeah yeah so also adding to it like organization need to take an operationalized approach to security intelligence not just to respond when there is an attack but also to know exactly what line of defense to take how to defend themselves and from where they are defending themselves absolutely absolutely So despite the best security measures there is a high probability every organization will experience a breach at some point in time what are your suggestions on our cyber resilient strategy and tips to help ceos that will help recover from incidents quickly with minimum possible damage well to a large extent you are right um, threats and attacks are inevitable and when when a sophisticated target attack is there uh, towards your enterprise i guess Uh, my hunch is that there is a higher success rate uh, so no matter how much you prepare how much you plan uh, it is it is important that you you adjust your approach when there is an incident so you need to be very vigil for again some of the core principles that i talked about but at the same bit of time you you also need to be vigil of how threat is evolving into your environment especially when in, when you are in the middle of the attack while there are a lot of documentation there are a lot of standards which are already available we you could you talk about nist framework you talk about um, other uh, benchmarks which are which are available and we can get into uh, again uh, those details but it would be too complex i guess uh, to answer this i'll i'll put it in 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 few bullet points let me first uh, talk about uh, one of the very important aspect which is first first and foremost is have a complete visibility to your cmd not many enterprises uh, do maintain cmd to an extent that uh, contains the utilities and each of the software and asset that is there into their environment there are a lot of blind spots uh, we we would have witnessed that into lockford's instance itself in the recent times when uh, uh, people were aware of the asset classes uh, that are there into their environment but not where those utilities are applicable and i guess that that is where the the difference lies so you have to have up to date cmdb which make sure that you do not have blind spots so i guess that knowing your environment becomes very very elementary and very very foundational and that is where have uh, one has to have up to date cmd and i'll i'll also rub uh, this point a little more especially to highlight that what if if you know in the initial few minutes that your that uh, the attack has happened because of a particular ransomware family or a malware family and by the virtue of you knowing that this is because of a particular ransomware or a malware family you would also know their modus operandi and the target attack surface what would be your first reaction and response you would obviously like to know where all it is present into my environment not only where it is uh, under attack but also where it could also propagate and have a lateral movement to my environment so your response would be very very fast if at all you do not have any blind spot and you have up to date cmdb right uh, uh, at few clicks then uh, i guess there is no excuse of not having a up to date cyber emergency response plan there is no excuse there cannot be and i guess that different people have it uh, in different forms and shapes but uh, uh, it is elementary this is again foundational in this have your plan uh, very much in place no matter whether it works 100% or no but unless you have it you would end up having duplicate uh, steps you would end up having total chaos or confusion 
among the stakeholders when they are to respond so it is very very important to have your uh, response plans ready covering all possible scenarios that you could think of make sure that uh, we remain agile and alert to the situation because no matter how much pre preparation that you do it is important that we have to readjust our approach when there when we are in the middle of attack we always need to need to acknowledge one fact that we cannot prepare for uh, uh, a target attack so while you are responding who knows uh, adversary is also changing its tactic and if that is so your plan would is bound to fail and that is exactly why you need to remain vigilant you need your teams need to remain alert and you need to agile in the way you are responding to that so understand your monitoring uh, events also which gives you enough cues to readjust your approach when something is going wrong and for the for this purpose i guess that you again need to move on to a very very strong uh, communication uh, plan which is where you need to know that who all you need to have communication with who all are the parties and stakeholders who need to interact and for what purposes are we involving our business side stakeholders are we involving our insurance bodies are we involving our oems in the way we are we are uh, uh, doing the communication in fact i would even uh, uh, admire that your testing of your plans while it is important and periodic testing is important but do we involve our oems our suppliers our customers our business stakeholders during uh, this testing not many people uh, do it and that is i guess is one of the biggest mistake that they do because when something goes wrong they become equal important stakeholder who provide you relevant information or they could provide you relevant information and could be could become very very handy uh, to gain that speed so i guess that that also is is very important i would like to also add two more important points uh, which i am able to again recall over and above what you of whether do you have plan or no it has to be updated it has to be tested your communication plan i guess a lot of people at times miss the documentation of the actions taken when there is a attack so if at all as i said that we have to readjust our approach we have to agile we have to remain be agile in the way we are responding to the adverse situation we take a lot of uh, prompt or imprompt uh, actions and if that is so make sure that you have the documentation up uh, document uh, you keep on documenting your teams keep on documenting all that that you are doing uh, when when you are taking action because if at all something is to be rolled back you know what you have done and in what sequence so i guess that that is something which which becomes very very important then obviously uh, have those plans again up to date once uh, this is over yeah sure sure so the call to action has to be documented and that's really important so so to sum it up we can say like it can seem daunting to manage a constantly expanding attack surface uh, but uh, leveraging the information that's already out there creating a solid foundation of monitoring and execution in your organization and spending time understanding how the enemy attacks can help you build up your defenses and keep your organization safe yeah. absolutely Yeah. So with this, I would like to thank you everyone for joining us today, and thanks, Mohit. We really appreciate your time and insights that you shared with our Six TV audience. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kalpana. Thank you, everyone. Hello, all. This is Dr. Lopa Mudra Basu, a cyber security and technology risk management professional. today we are in a connected world and the entire world is continuously fueled by data during the pandemic we can see that uh, how this entire economy is actually dependent on connected 
digital facilities. But with this on-growing trend of digitization and continuous generation of data, today we are facing another big challenge, that is a huge number of unused data which is going to a unused repository. Today, we are going to discuss that, how this data graveyard become a big challenge and rising, continuously rising concern for security. So as we know that data is the new fuel and empowering the entire connected world, it could be a smart cities, connected smart vehicle, smart governance, smart agriculture, smart wastage management system, smart transport, or smart water management system. Everything is connected. And data is actually the well that's running this behind this entire connected world. While we are looking back to the global risk landscape 2021, we can see two very interesting risks. One is digital power concentration. Another is digital inequality. That means if we look at both the risks, they are highly associated with the data. So when we have a good access and good understanding how this data are actually integrated with our ecosystem and how we can take the best benefit out of that, we can actually in turn capable to manage these two major risks which are actually a uh, very important and emerging breaks. Now coming to the uh, data proliferation part. So let's take an example of a mobile phone or a connected smartphone, which is continuously generating data. So generally we know that a smartphone is having an access to different ecosystem it, and while it's generating the data, it actually keeps sending that data to your laptop from uh, your uh, tab. It's a back and forth connectivity. Also, you may take those data to some storage like USB device. And again, you may restore the data to your home system, office system from where uh, some of the data we may send to the cloud. From cloud facility, it may go under the enterprise data center. From there, it may go to some data lake and back and forth. We continuously keep accessing. So there is a huge data proliferation. One of the major challenge with this data proliferation, while we are generating the data, we actually don't keep a tab that how many copies we are generating. So there are lots of copies of same data. They are structured, unstructured, semi-structured in nature. All data are not classified. Data within the corporate environment are partly classified, but the regular data generated by each of us, which is interconnected by enterprise, government, educational institute, there is no but on generating the data. So a data get generated, then it, there is a copy related to that somewhere going to be get uh, saved. And again, someone or the same person may conduct some modification, there will be another copy and it is not stopped there in the device from where it is generated. 
multiple copies are actually saved in different devices different storage and ultimately what happened ultimately this data going to slip in a data graveyard data graveyard is nothing but a giant repository of unused data and it become a rising concern or alarming concern for security now before getting insight that we need to look at what is that uh, major two things related with the data one is data privacy another is data protection now when coming to data privacy protecting sensitive personal identifiable information from unauthorized access and that make it available to a individual to determine who can access their personal data when it is coming to the data protection data protection basically protecting the data under processing rest and transition and allowing the access to the authorized person or authorized individual also protecting that throughout the life cycle from corruption and losses now when it is coming to data security versus uh, data privacy they are actually going hand in hand data security is an absolute requirement but privacy is an individual wish to determine the personal uh, sorry data security is an absolute requirement whereas privacy is an individual wish to disseminate the personal information also when it is coming to the privacy most important thing of privacy is today a person may give a consent to utilize some data but the person or the owner of the data restrict all the right to revoke the consent at any point of time now we can see that there are major data regulation and protection act across the world is continuously emerging also we can see lots of data lost during the uh, past year and there are lots of data breaches or non compliance related to data privacy act that leads to a huge penalty for some of the organization which has become a huge raising concern now let's look at the fundamental requirement of data security when it is coming to the data security data confidentiality is a fundamental requirement second is data integrity so confidentiality means we need to protect the confidentiality of the data as for the class of the data and the kind of protection required to ensure that integrity the origination point of the data the way it is originated need to be maintained throughout its life cycle so there should not be any tweak in between that is one of the major requirement to maintain the data integrity and now coming to the availability part ensuring the data is accessible to the authorized person based on the request now when it is a data graveyard and data are slipping a uh, kind of you know multiple version of same data uh, data classification is a major challenge and uh, making availability to the authorized person it's really a big question which data is actually 
going to be make available to whom so these three fundamental requirement of data security itself is a huge question mark and become a security blind spot now coming back to the operational challenges data source when the data is stumped in the data graveyard uh determining the data source from which source this data actually coming from sometime is not very clear adequate storage now when it is coming to storing the data it's good that every every enterprise is storing the adequate data for their decision making process uh boosting their capability to conclude to a right decision by collecting all kind of required data but the challenge is we need to have a place to store the data when it is coming to that storage place it's a physical place and require lots of investment as we know correct, uh, correctly that data security itself is a big blind spot we may have the best technology in place we may have a best professional in place but when it is coming to data graveyard actually protecting the data is a huge cost consuming the reason is we don't know what category of data which is the most precious data which is the or in authentic data so similar kind of security need to be provided to the majority of the data slipping there which is become a operational overhead and huge investment risks of loss so the capability to retrieve the data is a big question mark considering that data sources are not very clear data life cycle is not uh you know uh, uh, uh is not very well managed because data are slipping there since clarity is a challenge from a data sensitivity prospect so again risks of loss is huge compliance issue yes it can trigger a major compliance issue because when data life from is not very clear then we we provide a best security to ensure there is a proper protection in place still we may end up with the compliance issue because there are certain data uh is a kind of time stamp bound so basically when we are actually going to store some regulated data there is a requirement that after some time we are actually going to forge that data for example if there is a requirement under law that you uh, organization me uh need to protect its employee data after the last day of work or after retirement from that day to 10 years now if a organization going to purge that data before 10 years it's a non compliance again if the organization going to keep that data after 10 years that is also non compliance so if we consider this scenario unless until the clarity is in place it actually throwing a challenge of non compliance continuous change of data data is very dynamic in nature 
So it is continuously changing. And the system and the technologies associated to hosting the data uh, or when this data is in a resting phase or in processing phase, transition phase, is continuously changing, which leading to uh, lots of challenges related to data retrieval, as well as it's actually triggering a confusion during the data, uh, uh, multi due to data multiplication, and which in turn throwing a challenge in decision making capability of the organization. And above all, a huge cost associated with this because we don't know that what category of protection we need to give for this set of data. Now, we can see there is a huge challenge related to privacy principle, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. These are the three critical points related to privacy principle, which is completely missing here. Limitation of purpose of collection and processing. So when anybody, any organization collecting the data, purpose of collection and processing needs to be clearly defined. Under the data graveyard, this is again a blind spot. Data minimization. So in data graveyard, it's a dump, yard, dump uh, ground of the data, dumping ground of the data. So data minimization concept is not properly applicable in that scenario. Accuracy of data, again, when multiple copy is there, which one is correct is really a big challenge. Data storage limit, we know that that is not possible under this condition. Integrity and confidentiality is again a question mark. Now, uh, the question is when it is coming to the data graveyard, how we can manage this? The first thing is that we need to have a data governance in place to ensure that we have properly classified data in place and avoid as much as possible to move data inside the graveyard. For that, most important is having proper strategy that is policy and framework in place while we have that in place. The second most important thing is resource. Adequate skilled resource training for the trained resources need to be in place. And resources are again a continuously moving component from organization to organization. So there should be a established process in place to channelize that knowledge continuously. Now, when it is coming to the security, we need, or the privacy, we need to ensure that security and privacy actually adopted by design to, through secure architecture, thoughtful collection of data. So collecting data is not bad, it's really good, but it should be thoughtful. So we need to understand that there is a huge cost related to data storage and entire life cycle management. So we need to collect the data very thoughtfully to, by understanding the purpose of collecting that data. What is the business purpose associated with that? What kind of data we are collecting? What kind of protection that data demands under law? Also, what kind of protection minimal protection we need to provide to ensure that data is protected within our business environment and also secure purging of that data at the end of life cycle 
fizzle, that is the con uh, continuous monitoring, is very important throughout the data life cycle. That is from the collection to the end of the life cycle of data, that is the purging stage. So between this, data is going under processing, then transition, and then storage. We need to have a proper monitoring system to ensure that data is properly protected from a business perspective, as well as the legal requirement is properly addressed. In spite of that, there is a possibility data may got cracked, data may lost, data may break. So we need to have a proper resilience in place. We have to have a proper capability to manage the incident response. We need to have a secure recovery capability. Now come to the compliance part. There is a, a regulatory requirement related to compliance of different sector of that is the sectorial compliance. We need to ensure we maintain those sectorial compliance. There is a generic privacy compliance requirement of data that need to ensure when we are able to have a proper data governance in place, we have more transparency, which is going to give us a capability to have proper classified data and help us to reduce the unutilized data, which in turn help us to reduce the amount of data moving to the graveyard. And while uh, less data moving to the graveyard, it is actually going to contribute towards the minimizing the challenges related to data security, which is a kind of raising concern when it is coming to the data graveyard because data confidentiality, integrity, and availability become a huge challenge for the those data which are actually resting inside the data graveyard. Thank you. सरकार ऑफ बायोकॉइन द नेक्स्ट विनर इज अनुप्रिता दागा फ्रॉम यस बैंक नेक्स्ट अप आशीष खन्ना फ्रॉम द ओवरऑल ग्रुप Next winner is Ashutosh Jain from Indusind Bank. Next is Bhagwan N from 3i Infotech Limited. Next up, Bharat B Anand of EC Council. is Brijesh Datta of Reliance Geo. Next up, Burgess Cooper of EY. The next winner is Dharmesh Rathor of Wellspun Group. Next is Dipesh Thakur of Wadi Group. Next 
comes Ganesh AR of ICICI Bank. Next up, Ganesh Vishwanathan from 8th. Next is Kiyur Desai of SR. The next awardee is Kiran Balsekar of Aegon Life. The next winner is Krishna Machari N of HCL Technologies. Next up, Manmeet Singh of Lambda Therapeutic Research. The next winner is Manoj Sarangi of National Securities Depository Limited. The next winner is Milind Mungale from Protean eGov Technologies. The next winner is Nageshwar Rao of Yashoda Group of Hospitals. Next is Nasir Prakash of APC Northern Trust Corp. Next up, Pradiman Pandita from Hughes Cystic Corporation. The next winner is Prashant Vishisht of Maringo Asia Healthcare. Next up is Rajesh Natkarni of CDSL India. The next winner is Sachidanand Muchandi of JM Financial. Next up is Samir Ratolikar of HDFC. The next awardee is Sanjay Gogia from Ultram. The next winner is Sheetal Mehta of Wipro. The next winner is Shiv Kumar Pandey from BSE Limited. Next up, Sridhar Govardhan of Flipkart. The next awardee is Sridhar Sidhu of Wells Fargo. The next winner is Sridhar Singh from Mindtree. Next is Tushar Vartak from Rack Bank. And the next winner is Unique Kumar from CK Billa Group. Next up is Vishal Salvi from Infosys. And the next award goes to Vikas Arora from ITWP. And the next winner is Fal Gancha from DSP Mutual Fund. Many congratulations to the winners who have joined the League of Security Innovators. Here are the Indian security leaders that have won the Cyber Security Leadership Awards 2022. Winner is Ambarish Kumar Singh from Godrej and Boys. 
Next up, Amul Johar from AK Group. Next up is Anis Pankhania from Cap Gemini. Next up, Bijinder Mishra from Alchem Laboratories. The next awardee is Dilip Panjwani from LTI. Next up, Dr. Sushil Kumar Meher from Ames, New Delhi. The next awardee is Dr. Deepak Kalamkar from Paygate, India. Next up is Himanshu Sharma from Dalmia Bharat Group. Next award goes to Indranil Chatterjee of Ernst & Young. Next up is Kavitha Srinivasulu from GAVS Technologies. The next winner is Kushal Jadav from ABSLI. The next winner is Lalit Trivedi from ITI Asset Management Limited. Next up, Nitali Sharma from SDG Corporation. Next is Dimple Santwan from Saraswat Cooperative Bank. The next winner is Munir Wani from JNK Bank. The next awardee is Nand Kishore from Fernandez Foundation. Next up, Nitin Parashar from Geo Platforms Limited. The next winner is Rakesh Kumar Dvivedi from Geo Platforms Limited. The next winner is Ratan Jyoti from Ujjivan Small Finance Bank. The next award goes to Sachin Arvind Kavalkar from Niamu. The next winner is Samrat Bhatt from Match Move India. Next up is Sandeep Solanki from Secure Meters. Next up is Shashank Bajpai from ECGC Limited. The next winner is Srinivasan Mahalingam from Habelsec India Private Limited. The next winner is Umakan Tripathi from Larsen & Taubo Infotech. Next is Varundip Kaur from Spice Money Limited. Next is Vinit Sinha from Mastercard. And the next awardee is Viresh Kajaria from Axis AMC. For more updates from CXO TV, please like and subscribe to our channel.